People are dropping a kitchen table off of a deck. They usually only do this with beer bottles, but it's escalating tonight. Unruly teenagers standing in front of businesses near bus stop. Eight in total. 99% African American. A male came into the store to get a cash advance. He did nothing wrong, but seemed suspicious. He, he was a black man. Cornrows. Tan pants. Rabbit squirrel in the area! Attacking people that are trying to attend the caller's garage sale. Squirrel seems to be a fighter since it is missing an eye. Injured squirrel has head partially eaten off, but still alive in complainant's yard. Possibly drank antifreeze. Nephew purchasing marijuana from clerk at tobacco outlet. Puking and passing out at... Molly's Cupcakes isn't feeling very well after eating a sugar cookie. Complainant turned on oven and there was an explosion and small fire in their kitchen. A raccoon taking its eternal rest. Loud scratching on ceiling for the past hour. Unknown what it is. Thinks rodent, maybe bat. Loaned a Honda Accord to someone who he only knows the first name of, and they never brought it back. Complainant's neighbor keeps knocking at their door and running away. Hooting and hollering in the area. Received information that a few hours ago, someone saw a male of Middle Eastern descent wearing a red turban, standing next to some green gas cylinders, sticking up from the ground, looked like he was writing something down. Two black Angus cows near Moron Trek. The cows are still in the field, but it looks like they are going to run away. In the back parking lot... Red Nissan Altima. Overnight, someone threw a jar of Tostitos queso through his back windshield. Male who stands in front of his open window, masturbating on a regular basis. Caller is hanging out with a girl that wants to lay with him. But he is not sure if she's 18. And the caller does not want to get into trouble. All right. Uh, my name is Ben Burgess. This is Give Them an Argument. Uh, this episode, we're going to be talking to Thomas Frank about his new book, uh, The People Know, A Brief History of Antipopulism, and uh, with Freddie DeBoer uh, about this book, The Call to Smart, How a Broken Education System Perpetuates Social Injustice. Um, but, and, but first, I am going to be chatting uh, with Christopher Patton of the Iowa City Police Logs, which is a project he's been doing for a while, and he has a new book um, that the project has been turned into called The Iowa City Police Log, Life of, and Strife in a Midwestern College Town. The voices that you just heard uh, were An uh, Angie Speaks and Peter Coffin doing a dramatic reading of um, some actual lines from Iowa City's publicly available police logs, uh, which uh, Christopher has been transcribing to uh, amuse and sometimes disturb uh, Twitter uh, and Facebook for quite some time now. So uh, Christopher, welcome to the show. Hey Ben, thanks for having me. Yeah, so uh, this book is available for pre-order right now. We'll put a link in the description. Um, but uh, before the book, uh, you, you've been doing this for a while, this, this Iowa City Police Log. So you want to just generally talk a little bit about both what that is uh, and about what inspired you to do it? For sure. Uh, I think it was back in uh, as early as like 2012, I came across on the city's website uh, that in, in addition to the rest, arrest blotter where they say, you know, who got booked into the jail, they also have their activity log, which is basically their dispatch log. And uh, there's a number of different things in there, but mostly it's uh, transcriptions of it's really summaries that dispatchers write 
when so a police officer is being say dispatched to a noise complaint, it'll say noise complaints, we'll give the time and the address, and then there'll be a little note where the dispatcher will write a summary of what the complaint was. And quite often it's, you know, 50 college students smoking out of a bong, peeing in the front yard, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I, I stumbled across this and I, I just, I became really fascinated by it. So I eventually created a Twitter account for it and a, a Facebook account for it. And uh, just over time, I think to, uh, total now, I have like over 32,000 followers. So people seem to find it pretty compelling. Yeah, so a lot of this is just funny in a weird human way, like that tweet about loan to Honda Accord to someone, uh, they haven't brought it back, I only know their first name. Uh, a, a lot of it's kind of absurdist. Uh, some of it um, is disturbing for reasons that have to do with a lot of things that we know about how over-policing and the mass incarceration state work. Uh, there's a, you know, there's a decent smattering of racial stuff in there. Uh, but I think even beyond that, um, I think that part of the point that maybe you're trying to make with, with a lot of this stuff, you know, I mean, some of it's just entertaining, right? But like some of the, the larger political point is about the, the culture of a society that supports this level of policing and incarceration. Uh, because a lot of what you see in these logs are people calling the cops on each other over everything, nothing. Uh, and so I was wondering if you could just speak to that briefly. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, it, it amazed me. I, I knew this would, was going on to some extent, but really getting into this and looking through the log for, I read every single entry in it for over five years. And yeah, it's amazing how many people treat the police as though they're their parent or like their elementary school teacher. And it's like, you know, Billy is poking me, uh, you know, Sandy took my crayons and then people call the police over this. And, you know, uh, there's uh, quite a few people in the United States who are ultimately killed as a result of uh, right. contacts with law enforcement. Uh, and uh, it's, it's really uh, fascinating uh, and, and disturbing uh, how, how easily people are to, uh, to call the police and others uh, to bring them into any confrontation. And uh, to speak, you know, for example, to the racial bias point, or also I, there's a lot of uh, anti-homeless calls uh, that I highlight as well. And, you know, I think a lot of people think of Iowa City as this liberal college town, and in many ways it is, but, you know, there are really a lot of calls where people are just like, oh, there's, uh, there's a black kid on a bicycle in my neighborhood, he looks suspicious, or there's a black man uh, looking at his phone parked in a car out in front of my house. And, you know, it's, uh, people need to be aware that, that other people in the community are calling the police uh, on these issues, and we really need to wrestle with that and figure out what we can do about that, because, now, obviously, there's a lot that can be done with police reform or defunding, but really, this is focusing on the, the citizen end of it. This is the people who are calling the police and bringing them into the situation, and uh, we need to wrestle with that as a society, for sure. Yeah, absolutely, and, and the thing that you said about the anti-homeless calls, I think, also gets to one of the big dynamics underlying this, uh, because I, I think it, it speaks to a choice that we've made about a society, about how we're going to handle uh, extreme poverty and, and all the social ills that, that go with it, right? You know, there's, there's, a, there's a social democratic response that you could, you know, you could spend a lot more money on things like, um, well, housing, most obviously, right? And, um, and, and mental health counseling and, and a lot of other things like this. Uh, but it's both literally and politically cheaper uh, to just do a whole bunch of policing uh, and, and, and lock people up. Uh, and, and of course, a lot of those decisions are being made on a much higher level. But I, I think a lot of this is just a fascinating snapshot of what that looks like culturally, right? Where you have a lot of people, even in this kind of nice Midwestern college town, who are very, very used to handling any kind of anxiety they have about interactions with people at the bottom of society by calling the cops. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, a lot of it's for homeless people hanging out in downtown. If anyone's been in Iowa City, there's an area called the Pedestrian Mall or the Ped Mall. And it's this nice few blocks downtown where they've taken the cars off the streets and it's this nice paving stones and you can walk around all the different shops and sit on benches and things. But 
uh, there are several calls to the effect of there are homeless people sitting in the ped mall and it's gross looking. Uh, and the people are calling the police and saying that, or that there's one call in particular that I highlight where uh, someone calls and complains that there's a man at the farmer's market who's begging for money. And they said that he probably shouldn't be there because he's probably on welfare too. Uh, but then the woman making the call actually explicitly, she refused to give her name or her number because she was worried that people would think she was mean. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's some amount of self-awareness there, but not enough to not make the call. I don't know, but I, you know, I, I, I don't want to make it sound like that's, that's all there is to the book. You know, there, like you said, there's, there's entertaining stuff. There's bizarre party things and animal things. It's really, you know, it's the whole spectrum of life uh, in Iowa city. And, but, you know, I wanted to make sure to include uh, a critical mass of kind of these serious calls as well. It's, you know, I, I want it to be a, a book that's interesting for people and entertaining for people but I also want them to have to confront some of these issues of over-policing in the community. Yeah, right. No, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, and, and I think it's also worth emphasizing uh, that the, you know, that the point of the, the serious part, right? I mean, like I said, a lot of it's, a lot of it's kind of absurdist. A, a, a lot of it's just strange and funny human situations. Uh, but the, the point of the serious part is not necessarily to say, oh, look at those terrible people calling the police. Uh, it's 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 to highlight just the dynamics that play out in a society that's kind of made those choices about uh, mm -hmm. policing uh, as as opposed to uh, to other strategies for dealing with those social ills. Um, we've got to uh, uh, bring uh, bring Thomas Frank on for the next next part of the program, but I did just really quickly want to say uh, want to emphasize again this is available for pre-order, uh, so so people should please go do that. Also, uh, I know I saw you say on social media that um, the, at least some of the proceeds for the book were going to be sent to places that kind of highlighted what we're talking about when we talk about uh, defunding efforts to, to shift money from resources to uh, shift money and resources from police to other, um, to other kind of expenditures. So can you speak to that briefly? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I wanted to try to, you know, put my money where my mouth was on some of this. So all, all the profits from the book are going to be donated to three local organizations. That's the Neighborhood Centers of Johnson County, Shelter House, and United Action for Youth. And they're all groups that give uh, social services to, you know, lower socioeconomic uh, people, um, the homeless, uh, and uh, but children or young, you know, young people, uh, youth services. So hopefully uh, with more money towards those kinds of programs, we won't need to spend as much uh, on this ridiculous over policing. Right. Thank you so much, Christopher. Uh, the, um, the social media feeds for the Iowa City Police Log have been entertaining me and occasionally disturbing me for years. Uh, so I was, I was excited to see the, uh, the books coming out. Um, so everybody should go buy it and thank you one more time. Great, thanks a lot. All right, thanks Christopher. So uh, I'm now joined by Thomas Frank, uh, who's the author of uh, several books, including What's the Matter with Kansas, uh, Listen Liberal, uh, and now The People Know, um, A Brief History of Anti-Populism. 
uh, which uh, I just read and is a very excellent book. And I'm excited to, uh, to talk to Thomas, even though he's having trouble with his, uh, with his video. So he's a disembodied voice. I'm really so, sorry. Thank- Apol- I apologize again. <laughs> no, nothing, to, uh, nothing to apologize for, but I uh, really appreciate you coming, uh, coming on. Um, and uh, I, I will say I read uh, Listen Liberal back in 2016 and it had a big impact on me and I really enjoyed um, the, uh, the People Know uh, and I think it's a really interesting contribution to uh, the um, to our discussion about populism and the things that we mean by that, uh, and and how that relates to the kind of explicit anti-populism you get from a certain kind of centrist liberal. Uh, yes, and- you figured that out. You read <laughs> all the way to the end. <laughs> I, I did read all the way to the end. Uh, and and I was I was extremely actually interested in uh, in some of the connections that you were drawing in the last couple of chapters, and I do want to get to that. But uh, but first, I want to kind of set the scene for the way you start the book because there's this really interesting uh, contrast uh, between um, that you that you draw. Uh, between the way that populism is discussed by academics, right? You hear this a lot. People who are like populism experts, they, you know, they. There's a whole. There's a whole uh, uh, academic uh, discipline. I don't know if discipline is the right word. A pedagogy, let's say. It's sort of interdisciplinary. But yeah, there's a. You, the, you're right about that. The, um, the, the very fashionable academic pedagogy, and people are forever emailing me about, you know. To comment on well, the, long story short, they're they're not really interested in what I'm saying here. So, yeah, no, absolutely, uh, and and you can see why, right? Because the things that we hear from people in this industry of anti of anti populism experts uh, essentially uh, is that um, there's um, is that. Populism is essentially anti-intellectual. Populism is essentially racist and xenophobic. Um, And of course, all of that makes a really interesting contrast to the original populist, because if you're gonna make a generalization about some category, you know, there's there's an interesting, uh, you know, there's an interesting question about, okay, like, how do we figure out what counts as part of this category? This is the kind of thing that philosophers love to do, conceptual analysis, figure out, okay, something counts as an instance of this larger phenomenon. Yeah, uh, well, if and only if. Si- yeah, political you know, science, this is what they do now. So. Yeah, absolutely, right? Uh, but it seems like if you're gonna make a generalization about populism, whatever you include as an example of populism or not, you should probably include the populists, like the people who came up with the name? Yeah, so that's, that's, that should be example number one, but it's almost never mentioned in this literature, in this sort of, uh, this academic, uh, this pedagogy that we're describing. They never talk about those guys, the, the people who actually invented the word, uh, the American group that came out of the Midwest, you know. Uh, I assume that, that, you know what, your, your listeners might have never heard of it, so why don't we talk about that for a minute? the people who invented the word it was an american yeah. word it's not a french word it's not a you know um uh, a latin word it's it was made up on a train between kansas city and topeka in the year 1891 and uh it meant something very specific and uh it meant it was a reference to this third party movement in america a left-wing third party movement um that was uh like I say, that was on, on the left. It was our, it was my people. And uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that's very uncomfortable for the people who want to talk about populism nowadays, who want to define it as being, you know, this other thing, because the, uh, the original, po- what you described earlier, because the original populist movement has almost nothing to do with that stuff. Yeah, so, so, they, sorry, it's really inconvenient for them. And so they leave it out. They don't talk about it. Yeah, so the original populist movement, we're talking about the People's Party, uh, yeah. which is probably the most like electorally viable third party that's existed since. Yeah, the, well, there were since the Republicans. The Republicans yeah. were the third party that, that managed to kill off one of the two major parties. 
Uh, and then populism, rather than killing off one, they thought they were going to do the same thing, but instead what happened was they got absorbed by the Democrats. Uh, largely. I mean, not, not, it wasn't not completely. Yeah. And, and I think there's a complicated history there where parts of, you know, people who were involved in the People's Party end up in later efforts like the Socialist Party of Eugene Debs. Yep. Uh, well, Debs himself was a populist at one point. Um, and uh, after, the, after the big strike in 1894, he came out of prison and he was a populist. Uh, and he was their hero for a while. Uh, but they didn't last very long after that, only a couple more years. And then that was, they sort of, that, that was the end of them. They got on board with the uh, William Jennings Bryan Express and, uh, yeah. and <laughs> they yeah, so, didn't so, make so, it across the finish line. <laughs> right. So I want to talk about that, that election. Uh, you know, you spend a lot of time in the first part of the book talking about how everything these, these academics who study populism, yeah, what they, they call would, populism. They mean, no, they mean Trump, they mean Marine Le Pen, they mean like the, the president yeah, of Poland Hushard. and the president of Hungary and this sort of thing. These kind of uh, bigoted nationalists, uh, you know, that's, that, that's, that's what they mean by it. And it is, it, is, it is truly a strange turn of events that they use uh, the word populism to describe those people. Not that it, yeah. there's anything wrong with studying those people. I mean, I, I write about, I used to write them about, about them, I should say. I used to write about them all the time. Uh, they need to be studied. We need to understand what makes uh, Trumpists tick, you know? Right. But, uh, uh, but uh, it's just, you know, yeah, the, there, the, is if, a, there is a price to abusing the word populism. And we'll come to that in a little while. Anyhow, I, I interrupted you. You wanted to talk about the 1890s. Oh no, I I do right because but uh, but I think what you're talking about is important uh, bit of scene set in here uh, because what the academic uh, populism experts mean when they say populism right uh, they're they're mostly talking about this kind of Trump Bolsonaro Le Pen right wing pseudo populist authoritarianism uh, but they I th I feel like oftentimes the effect of using this word populism in the way that they do is to equate that with and thus delegitimize, you know, like nice social Democrats like Bernie Sanders. Yes, of course. That's a yeah. big part of the problem. And then, but the, it's, I mean, that's part of it. Well, think about it. That is, that is literally what they are doing. They're taking the name of the original American social democratic movement and using it to describe proto-fascism. So that by itself is pretty screwed up. The, uh, uh, yeah, but and, in, and in a the historical points, sense, but there's a, there's a yeah. larger way in which the anti-populism is a, a, a kind of a, uh, a fear of democracy and a fear of, of mass working class movements. So the, 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 the hatred and fear of left-wing movements is baked in. You know, you can say, oh, you know, uh, well, I mean, there's people who, who I mean, these are by and large the the uh, scholars that you're talking about are uh, liberals. They or they would call themselves liberals, you know. But uh, their my argument is that in the the way they word pop, the way they use the word populism betrays a real suspicion, if not hostility, to democracy. Uh, can I yeah. can I explain a little more what I mean? I think I've yeah, confused uh, you, absolutely. Ben. See, I can see you very clearly. You can't see me <laughs> at all, but I can see that I have confused you. No, no. I mean, this. I mean, I mean, I did. I did read your book. You said actually. You know what? There. I'm actually in your house, and I'm going to come walking <laughs> through that door right behind you here in just a second. And I'm going to start. I'm going to pick up my book off your shelf from behind you, and yeah. start read, reading from it. <laughs> no, that's 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 great. Um, then then everybody will see you on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> so um, so so yeah. I was, I was going to say. Uh, you know, you, you point out that, that these people, the, the People's Party who coined the word populist, uh, fit none of these boxes. They weren't anti-intellectual. Uh, yeah. Ironically, the main reason they were accused at the time of being anti-intellectual. Yes, they were, they were against the gold standard. Isn't that funny? And there's like, everybody's yeah. against the gold standard today. You, you'd be, you'd be a, a crank if you were in favor of it. Did you see, by the way, that Trump, the great the great populist nominated a woman for the Fed Federal Reserve Board who's like, who wants to bring back the gold standard. Did you see this? <laughs> I, I mean, the ironies, that's, that's, that's the ironies in, this little, in this little story are just so insane, you know? Yeah, but yeah, because yeah, the, uh, the, the, like, the, the main populist push 
uh, to go to the silver standard, but the really fringe populist idea, like the thing that people really thought was the real, if you're a real pure populist, you know, if you're yeah, a yeah, hardcore populist, you wanted fiat currency, which right, is right, what right, we right. have now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and and only like kooky, like Ron Paul people, and I guess now this Trump appointee want to actually go back to the gold standard. Well, there now. was a, so years ago, I I wrote a book about um, it was a kind of a history of the conservative movement. It was called the Wrecking Crew, and in the early days of the Reagan administration, there was a movement within the administration within the Republican Party to put us back on the gold standard, and uh, I looked into this. It's actually it was it was hilarious because it was so dumb but you know they <laughs> but there there was this brief moment in the 80s where people were talking about that like it was a serious thing um but no nobody yeah, yeah. It's, it's and, completely and, gone and for good for good reason and you mentioned that the original populists in the 1890s uh they ended up you know instead of replacing a, a major party they ended up endorsing the democratic nominee william jennings bryan uh, who had a platform that was uh, at least very tinted with with populist ideas? Yeah, and well, thing, he he, yeah. he talked he talked like them. He was from Nebraska, and he used a lot of the, of similar reform language, and uh, and he was he was look. He was an incredible orator, and mm -hmm. when he talked, his famous speech about the gold standard is really worth going back and looking at because th this is the moment when the Democratic Party becomes a party of the left. Before 1896, like the the president at the time, Grover Cleveland, was a Democrat. Grover Cleveland was was no more to the left of the Republicans. I mean, they were the same, the Republicans and the Democrats, but they were regional. The Democrats were largely Southern, uh, and then like New York City. Uh, and, they, and they were ethnic. So the, uh, you know, a lot of recent immigrants were Democrats, that sort of thing. The Republicans were based in the North. It was all, you know, at post-Civil War stuff. But uh, they both uh, agreed on the gold standard. They both agreed on, uh, the, you know, how industrialization was to be handled, which is it, it, it has nothing to do with politics at all. You want to support business. You don't ever want to do anything to support labor. They were in, the Democrats and Republicans were in complete agreement at that time. And then when Brian got nominated in 1896 by the Democratic Party, this is a huge break. This is the, one of the two main parties in America taking these little steps, little baby steps towards becoming a social democratic party. Now, they, it was a tiny step, right? But uh, if you go back and read Brian's speech, it sounds off awesome. You know, he sounds fantastic. The stuff he's talking about, you know, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor, this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon this cross of gold. It's, it's genius. Uh, yeah. And uh, anyhow, they, they, uh, the, the populace said, look, he's not with us on all of our other issues. They wanted to do all sorts of things other than uh, get mm -hmm. off the gold standard. And uh, they said, but he is good on this one issue and if he wins then we'll be in the um you know we'll, we'll we'll be if we back him and he wins then you know we'll we'll have some say in washington it was a gamble uh and it was uh, you know and it a lot of the populists were really they felt bad about it they did not like uh endorsing this guy they you know they'd fought the democrats pretty hard in a lot of places uh but uh uh they did it they got on board and then he, and then he lost <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that, and that was the end of it. Then after that, populism just fell apart. Yeah, uh, and this, ele this election that he lost, uh, that, I mean, I thought that was one of the most fascinating things in the book because uh, going back to how the anti-populism industry sees like Donald Trump as, as the ultimate populist, what I kept thinking as I was reading about this election with uh, McKinley as, as the Republican and the populist supported uh, William Jennings Bryan as, as the Democrat, is that certainly in 2020, 2016 was a little bit different. Uh, 2016, Trump was at least uh, using some language that about like resentment towards economic elites. Oh, he's, uh, he still does that. He still, he still does he, it. He, just, he, he, has no, does he has no reason in the world to use it. He has no right to it at all, but he does it. <laughs> yeah, he, he does. But one thing that really struck me about this is that actually the guy in that 1896 election who, who tr the Trump 2020 campaign sounds like 
is much less William Jennings Bryan than it is McKinley. Like yeah, well, down absolutely. to yeah, down the anarchy, to the constant fear mongering about anarchists. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so the the uh, the right wingers, if you if you read the. Uh, the, the, the part of the book about that, I don't want to say right wingers, nobody used that term in the 1890s, they would have called themselves uh, conservatives, uh, uh, eminent gentlemen, I don't know, uh, orthodox, uh, they were, you know, they, they, these were the people who owned America. And, you know, they, they didn't think of themselves as really even having politics that they just thought they were that, that what they believed was was normal and was in some ways, um, uh, handed down by God, you know, it was like the, these were things, idea like the gold standard. This is something you just didn't mess with. But um, they, uh, one of the terms that they used to describe populism and to describe and to sort of to to go after Brian and they, as you know, they 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 really destroyed Brian in the most incredible propaganda campaign, like one of the most incredible propaganda campaigns ever seen in this country. But one of the terms that they used was free riot. Because uh, Brian's uh, policy was what he called free silver. This is what it was going to replace the gold standard was, was free silver. It, 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 we don't need to get into what it meant here. It was basically a silver standard. But uh, the Republicans were like, oh, yeah, what he really supports is free riot. And th their reasoning on this was ridiculous. It was because there had been... Um, Oh, geez. Well, oh, yes. There had been the Pullman strike in 1894. The uh, federal government had sent in the army into Chicago to put this, uh, put the strike down. And there had been riots, of course, this sending the army in. all these people fought back. And it was, you know, it got a little out of control. And the uh, governor of Illinois at the time, whose name was John Altgeld, was a Democrat. And Altgeld said, you know, we don't want the army in, uh, in Illinois, you know, please don't send them. There's no disorder here. And uh, uh, Altgeld was at the convention and was actively campaigning for Brian. And so everybody was like, well, this is free riot. He's in favor of riot. And it's, it is identical to what the Republicans are saying this year. Also, one other thing, everybody, nobody remembers this. McKinley was the tariff man of his day. They called him the Napoleon of protect his idea was that you could now you see if this sounds familiar you could use tariffs to accomplish any domestic policy goal you wanted to reach anything you wanted to do you could do it with tariffs you know you could force other countries to behave in this way and that that was mckinley's great sort of uh, idea yeah and you, and you point out trump is books, exactly the same the uh, the that the original populists uh not only were actually uh, not that that protectionist. Uh, no, they, they were free they, traders. They were free yeah, traders. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they were like they're, they're farmers. Their, farmers are always free traders. It's you know. Yeah. One of their uh, ideas was you know they wanted a government built um, uh, to build a uh, a railroad to the coast to uh, to yeah. make it easier for them to engage in international yeah. trade. Well, so they didn't have to ship their stuff through Chicago and New York and Philadelphia. They wanted to run a railroad from like kansas city down to galveston texas you know and and uh, avoid everybody else and have it run by the government they came up with all sorts of schemes like this none of them ever really um came to pass but yeah know, that was one of their it's, yeah right so so i mean if, if you just kind of go through the checklist all right so any intellectual not so much uh protectionist not so much yeah um you know racist uh no, they were they were the good very... guys on that on that on that issue in 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 their day and uh, you know they were they were they were not anti-racist by modern standards that would not apply to them a lot of them were of course racist but they were also able to uh say well we need to reach out to black voters and have you know and and get people together on a class on the basis of class rather than the basis of race which was kind of enlightened for that time uh, yeah. no, it, it didn't work. It fell apart, sure. you know, and, but they, they tried it. They did try, which nobody yeah. else was, was doing. You yeah, know. right. And, and you, you quote in the book a speech from Martin Luther King where he talks about how the reigning, you know, bourbon Democrats in the South uh, used racial hatred as a way of suppressing, um, you know, populist threats to them. Uh, and yes. there's a really, really striking it, well, it line was, in there about for, how, for, you know, they were telling, you know, like poor white farmers that they could uh, that you know they weren't going to give them food but they could eat jim crow yeah it, it's one of king's greatest speeches but what it what is 
one of the things, this is a speech he gave at the end of the Selma to Montgomery March in 1965. And he actually does a shout out in the speech to real, to populism, this movement from the 1890s. And what, what, what I love about, and it's a great speech and, and you can watch it on YouTube. And I suggest that everybody that is, uh, that is listening right now, uh, go and watch it because it's, it's, it's one of his fantastic moments. But he does this shout out to populism that is clinically exactly historically accurate which is like nobody ever does anymore you know it was it's it's weird he actually gets it almost a hundred percent correct uh so that but there were other civil rights leaders that knew this story it seems to have been something that was uh that was passed down i was i i didn't include this in the book because i didn't find it until i was until i was completely done and had the book turned in but w.e.b du bois wrote an essay about this as well uh it's it, it was I feel stupid that I couldn't find it when I was writing the book because I'd heard of it, but I couldn't find it anywhere. And I didn't find it until I'd actually turned everything in. But he wrote about the, the very same thing and how this was the one sort of bright spot between Reconstruction. Well, when Du Bois wrote in the 1920s, it was the one bright spot, period. There was, I mean, after populism got beaten down in the South, uh, then the Southern uh, ruling class disenfranchised black people and a whole a lot of poor whites as well just took the vote away from them they set up you know these literacy tests and the poll taxes and all that and that was the end of it and uh uh that's how they killed this sort of nascent left-wing movement in the 1890s um yeah it's, and, and and as the it's scary on, stuff once you start digging into it oh yeah definitely and as the book goes on you you trace the development uh after the defeat of the original populists uh, through this kind of long story of the way that one, the word populism starts to mean everything and nothing, uh, yeah. just just supporting some popular policies, maybe, or just, you know, whatever, <laughs> yeah. right? You know, anything, yeah. any, anything right. well, Yeah, Jimmy Carter called himself a populist when he was running for president in the 70s. I, I'm, <laughs> you're, uh, I'm, I'm older than you, but, uh, you know, he had this sort of soft-spoken way you know, he was very unpretentious and he thought that was populism. And then Ronald Reagan, I don't think Reagan ever used the word himself, but his advisors used it all the time to describe him. <laughs> so you had right, 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 populist right. versus populist, you know, and uh, hell, George W. Bush, I'm sorry, George H. W. Bush, his dad, uh, he, he was advised by this complete scoundrel, Lee Atwater. <laughs> Right. Atwater called George Bush a populist. This is like the preppiest man in America. <laughs> and uh, I mean, these are, it, yeah, the word just, it just, it just came completely loose from its moorings uh, in well, yeah, the yeah, you, beginning I mean, in the 50s, but then in the 60s and 70s, it was just like, it was just lost. People used it to mean whatever they wanted. Yeah. And the other half of the story is the rise of this kind of explicitly anti-populist uh, version of liberalism, uh, yes. which, which, which I think relates in an interesting way. This is one of the things I wasn't expecting when I started the book, but in, in the last section of it, there's, there's like a fairly pointed critique of what's sometimes called cancel culture in which you relate to this kind of anti-populist liberalism. Uh, in particular, I'm thinking of uh, something that you mentioned uh, involving the uh, actress and writer Lena Dunham, <laughs> yeah, yeah, where she she uh, she overhears some. This was this was a mildly famous. The thing about Lena Dunham is she's had so many of these Twitter controversies in the course of her career. It's in some ways uh, you look at all the stuff that's that she's said and done and that has happened to her, and you you feel kind of sorry for her. Sure, uh, but I mean, like saying all these dumb things on Twitter and getting people angry at her, but constantly trying to be more righteous than. <laughs> others but apparently she was wandering through an airport somewhere her flight was delayed and uh, she overheard or she thought she thought she overheard some uh, airline employees saying something transphobic and she she went on uh, twitter and tried to turn them in to the airline management you know so that everybody could see her doing it it wasn't just enough to like she couldn't just go over and talk to them Right. You know, and say, you know, I heard that and that was really inappropriate and you're going to make people really unhappy. She couldn't do that. And she, you know, instead she had to do, you know, like turn them in, in a highly visible. And for, for me, that was, um, that was, uh, you know, you know, the, the airline then reported they, they couldn't figure out who she was talking about. And this was, 
you know, they yeah, didn't yeah, think anything could really happen. But it was yeah. typical of this kind of mindset that glories in um, turning people in, in scolding people, and uh, uh, and for me, that is where a lot of a lot of modern day liberalism has gone. You know, I uh, especially after Hillary Clinton went down uh, to defeat. You know, Hillary used this phrase. Um, what are you drinking, by the way? Oh, this is a, uh, I'm, I'm in Atlanta. This is a nice uh, Atlanta beer. It's uh, ah, Sweetwater 420. Too early in the day for beer. <laughs> but, okay. So, uh, Hillary, of course, that, yes. made, that, made that, you know, that she used the term deplorables. And um, she knew immediately that she'd made a terrible gaffe and tried mm -hmm. to get out of it. Uh, but what's funny is that so many liberals embraced that and we're like no that is exactly the right thing we should be calling trump supporters these names and by the way and and that that term uh you know millions of people heard it and said you know uh, hillary clinton is looking down her nose at us you know she is this fancy lawyer uh, you know professional and uh she is you know she she has contempt for ordinary americans like me and uh, Hillary knew that was that was that was bad, and as I said, tried to get out of it. But a lot of people are like, "Hell yes, I do have contempt for or, for ordinary people." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and my really... my point is, my point is, what kind of liberalism is that? This is a, yeah. a, a this is a form of liberalism that really does uh, think of itself as a top down sort of an act of scolding, uh, yeah, well, not the, the as most... an act of. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the most striking thing about that uh, Lena Dunham story in your book was that when she, as you said, it wasn't good enough to report, you know, whoever she heard or thought she heard uh, to their bosses to get them fired, right? She also had to report them to all of Twitter. And when she did, uh, she said something like, uh, it's more important than ever that we teach our employees yes. uh, to be, you know, compassionate or inclusive yes. or whatever it was she now, said. Now that is the great reversal of our time, that it's now the employers who teach us <laughs> to not be racist and to not be sexist and to not be transphobic. It used to be the other way around. The, the, you know, because unions are forever suing uh, employers for, uh, uh, for being racist. I mean, this happens all the time. But the fantasy today is the other way around, that the, you know, the, that the, the sort of white collar ruling class will, will teach the, uh, you know, the, the unwashed, the great unwashed hordes to behave. And I, I'm here to tell you, if that's your model of liberalism, you, you can forget about ever winning another election, you know? It's, yeah. it's, as a way of building a mass movement, this is, uh, this is a disaster. This is a recipe for disaster. Populism, yeah. populism says we bring together people from all sorts of different backgrounds. Uh, you know, hey, do you think the video is working? No, it's still- <laughs> Oh my hey! God, it is! Now it's back. It's All back. Right. Outstanding. Uh, yeah. Thomas Frank, so it, not in my house. Uh, he is, uh, no, I'm, uh, all along. All along, I've been right here in my own house. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and what you're talking about, right, with, with, with Dunham, that, that version of liberalism that just explicitly takes for granted that it's speaking by and for... And, and that, uh, well, that, that people who are lower down in the social hierarchy are are bad people, you know, that they have to be taught by we, the professional class. Uh, and that is, uh, and that's, uh, you encounter that attitude everywhere you go in, in the land, in liberal land these days. And I'm here to tell you that is a, that is, uh, well, it's deeply anti-populist, obviously, and it's a recipe for disaster, but it's also where we're going. I mean, the, uh, the whole idea of building a gigantic coalition of working class people, you know, from all different racial backgrounds and, and uh, different parts of the country and different, all different walks of life. That's what populism is. That's the historic definition of it in this country. That has never in my lifetime been further away from the sort of, uh, I mean, uh, mainstream liberals now, it's like they don't even know that history. They don't even know that that's where their movement came from. They think it is and has always been just a movement of, you know, uh, uh, highly educated people wagging their finger at everyone else. You know, yeah, yeah. There's the, the, you had a nice. Um, uh, they've they've line, deleted line all that history. They've adapting, deleted it. Adapting uh, George Orwell's uh, line from 1984 about this version of progressivism, uh, you know, is a finger wagging in the face of you know someone it's a who proletariat forever. forever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, 
and, and actually, uh, like this, this is basically like where you end this book is basically what your uh, previous book, Listen Liberal, was all about. Uh, because that book, uh, I remember I, I read it or I listened to the audio book, uh, you know, over the course of many dog walks and, you know, uh, washing the dishes. Uh, and, but tell me something, Ben. Did you listen yeah. to this or did you read it? <laughs> the new one. Uh, did you li listen or read? Uh, I actually, for this one, I did some of each because I had um, I had a, um, a PDF of it uh, that was that was that was sent to me in preparation for this interview. So I was going back and forth between the two the two formats as I went through it. Uh, but listen, liberal is about the way that the Democratic Party, like at least in its dominant wing. Uh, yes. sees politics and has sort of evolved to start seeing politics since the 1970s, uh, where it, it takes really, uh, it's a very pure expression of the worldview of what sometimes in that book you call uh, the professional class. Uh, yes, or, and, that's, you know, and I, yeah. when the book came out, people are like, well, what is that? I've never heard of that before, <laughs> but I'm here to tell you the professional class is real. This is, <laughs> this is not a term that I just made up. It is, it is for real. Uh, there yeah, is yeah, so a professional the, class. They are in a, they are a very mm -hmm. affluent group. Uh, you know, it is an elite, and the Democrats do have have evolved. You you put it very well, actually. Have evolved to be this very pure expression of that particular cohort's uh, uh, way of seeing the world, uh, their policy agenda. You know, right right down the list. Uh, yeah, it's, and, it's and, actually it's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the book. You know, in some ways, Biden yeah. is. Well, I don't really want to talk about Biden, but he's 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 <laughs> he's slightly different from that. No, because 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 he's because he is even though his uh, his policy preference you know lines up fairly well with the people you're talking about, uh, his political style really predates this shift. You know. Like, oh yeah, he's, he's very he's old, very, very old fashioned. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but I but I mean it'll all be up to the people that he appoints, and it w you know you get yeah. one guess who that's. Gonna, <laughs> who yeah, that's yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, of course. <laughs> uh, but the book uh, "Listen Liberal," you know, came out in uh, 2016. I remember reading or you know listening to it. It came uh, out right in after. March. All my books come out in March or April of an election year, except for this new one, which got delayed for the pandemic because it was supposed to come out then. And then we, we, we were like, well, what are we going to do? Because the pandemic hit. And so we sat on it for like four months. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and it didn't, didn't help. You know, I still can't yeah. go anywhere. I still can't go on a book tour and go to bookstores and talk about it. You know, well, at least, at least you can do this, which is awesome. Yeah, no, that's, that's right. And I appreciate it, by the way. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you coming. I'm but... sorry, but I, I interrupted you. You were just saying, so it came out. Oh, no, I was, was going to say, it came out And, it came and when out I wrote it, you know, I didn't even mention Trump. I think he's mentioned once in the original text. Well, well and you also, if I recall correctly, uh, you never mentioned Bernie Sanders, probably because it was written too early. But uh, when I was listening to it, which I guess was a few months after it came out, uh, and the, the Democratic primary um, had, had just wrapped up, uh, and, I, and I remember, um, you know, listening to this book and thinking that what this is, is a code key to the basic thing that was going on in that primary, because you had this, all these things that never made sense to me fell into place about the way that, for example, uh, the supporters of Hillary Clinton would endlessly talk about how she was the most qualified yes. candidate who had ever yes. run. Yes. Uh, and, 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 and of course, even on its own terms, it's a slightly dubious claim. You know, you've, you've had people who were former vice presidents and say, whatever, it doesn't matter, right? But, uh, but the more interesting question is, why was it that they thought that this should be the checkmate argument, that of course this is the person you want, because look at how qualified she is, right? You know, know that like, know. That what well, that's because the, the meritocracy, wait, is, you're, you're gonna have Fred, yeah. you're gonna have Freddie DeBoer on here in a second, yep. right? I mean, this is it, this is, it's all about the, in fact, here he comes, but uh, there he is, I can see him on my screen, but can the viewers see him? Yes, they can. But the, it, it's, uh, yeah, but that is, that is the basic argument from meritocracy. Uh, which is meritocracy really is the, uh, you know, classes have ideologies. They have this sort of worldview that's associated with them. And that is the uh, meritocracy is the worldview of this uh, sort of professional 
white collar elite that 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 you're describing. Yeah, because, because that is absolutely how they see the world. And since yeah. then, there's been a number of good books uh, come out about uh, this the, the whole problem of meritocracy. And I think it's more uh, the problem is so much worse than anything I you know than the way I, I I put it in Listen Liberal. It's just it's it's so dreadful. And I don't see you know I'm, I'm talking about the way that. Um, you know, you go to one of these five or six or seven universities, your entire life trajectory is determined by that. You go to a school that's not one of those like seven universities and you're basically, um, you're screwed. And there's, uh, uh, you know, anyhow, we can oh, talk yeah, about this yeah. some, we'll cover this some other time because we're getting no, pretty well, far away from populism, but needless well, to say, well, populism I, is I, the I, opposite I of is, all that stuff. Well, I think this is interesting, right? Because I think this is, obviously what Listen Liberal is about, but it's also what the last part of your book is about, is about the, you know, the, well, you know, the book is a brief history of anti-populism, right? You know, and, and this is a key part of that story of self-conscious anti-populism uh, is the rise of a version of liberalism that, you know, whatever the complications were of uh, New Deal, great society liberalism, which uh, which shouldn't be romanticized, you know, that at the same time that he was implementing great society programs, uh, you know, Lyndon Johnson was committing war crimes in Vietnam that, you know, verged on the genocidal. Uh, but uh, there, there is this really important shift between seeing uh, industrial workers often as the natural base of the Democratic Party, trying to speak a language that, that, uh, that centers concerns that would make sense to those constituencies yep. and, and then doing the, or do on the other hand doing the bill clinton thing where it's like well you people are have been made obsolete by history and so we the democratic party we want to be on the side of the people who are going to be the winners in the new you know the new economy. yeah hillary clinton said like bragged about how she, yep, she that's right she, no that's sort of the, the capstone of it all but it began with it began years earlier you know that i mean they, they they you know with the democratic leadership i'm so much older than you guys the democratic leadership council do you know what this was yeah, this was uh, this was the group that moved. Their object was to move the Democratic Party to the right. You know, they were ferociously against organized labor and you know, et cetera, et cetera, and constantly denouncing um, working class, basically denouncing working class people. And um, uh, their their grand idea became, uh, you know, we need to embrace the new economy that's coming, the information age. But you know, which is like, okay, fair enough. So so you know, the economy is changing. I get that. But here's the key point: they wanted to embrace the winners in this new economic order, not the you know, not the. I mean, there's still going to be workers in the new world, of course. You know, even though the the means of production change, you're still going to have you know millions and millions of of, of of working class people, but their idea was no. We want to be on the side of the, the the ones they called the learning class, also known as the creative class. And you you're you're familiar with this whole literature of uh, of you know. The yeah, yeah. So so actually, I'm I'm glad that uh, we're we're joined by Freddie DeBoer before Thomas has to leave, uh, because. I've, really got, I, I've got a bourbon bottle in the other room that's calling out for me, by the way. Got... <laughs> well, I mean, feel free to pour one and uh, stay here, but uh, uh, nothing, uh, I'm certainly not going to object to that. But, in a, but uh, because I think that what you really talk about in Listen Liberal is this conception of progressivism where their conception of social justice just is unhindered meritocracy that what yes. social injustice is yes would be racism or sexism or anything else like that ask yourself why is that why why is that why are they so focused on, i mean those are bad things obviously but what about yeah. you know there's lots of other like awful anti-social uh attitudes out there that they just don't give a shit about right uh, uh yeah greed, because 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 know? the what's seen as the unjust thing about those is that these are artificial blocks to the best and the brightest from each group Boom. Yes. rising to the Isn't top. Isn't that fascinating? It, it is. And, um, and so uh, joined by uh, Freddie DeBoer, um, who has uh, written a book uh, called The Cult of Smart, uh, How a Broken Education System Perpetuates Social Injustice, uh, which is all about this meritocratic worldview and what's wrong with it right that they that like one one way of 
of understanding it is to say, look, of course, as anybody who's, you know, uh, spent time, you know, as I have teaching in different places, you know, around people from, you know, very affluent backgrounds, knows we're very far from living in a genuine meritocracy, no doubt about that. Uh, but um, meritocracy, Freddie argues, wouldn't actually be all that great if we had it. Oh my God, it would be awful. Are you kidding me? <laughs> oh wait, uh, I bet you want me to shut up and it's time for me to shut up. I should let you two go. I should let you two chat. All right, well, go, go, uh, go enjoy your bourbon. But can I, I just want, I'll, I'll watch you guys a little bit, but uh, uh, I just wanted to say, uh, the, the, I love the title. I love Freddie's title, The Cult of Smart. And in a certain kind of, you know, I, I went to graduate school uh, years ago and uh, I used to hang around with people who basically used the word smart as interchangeable with correct. You know, that was just the, 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 the for them. I mean, the, the title is so exact in getting at a certain, you know, a certain personality type and a certain way of thinking. Anyhow, I think it's yeah. great. So. Correct, good, worthy of the good things in life. <laughs> yeah, smart. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right. Thank you so much for coming on, Thomas. This is fantastic. I, I hope you can come back. You got it, man. All right. Thanks. All right, that was Thomas Frank, uh, who's the author most recently of The People Know, A Brief History of Anti-Populism. Uh, now we're joined by uh, Frederick de Boer, um, who um, I, the book says Frederick. I've, I've been reading his stuff for years, and I've always seen Freddie, right? So the, uh, the Fre Freddie is fine. Yeah, Freddie is fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I thought that would be an interesting juxtaposition uh, because so much of Frank's critique of contemporary liberalism is about this idea that justice just is meritocracy. If we can really have the, the smartest, most talented people in charge and, and getting the rewards of that, then, then we've, we've achieved a just society. Uh, and what, what, you're, um, what you do in, in this book is, is really get into all of the reasons why that's not an ideal worth wanting. Yeah, I think that um, one of the one of the points that I make, I think, pretty early in the book, is that um, our our entire conception of the purpose of schooling is incoherent because it is based on flatly uh, uh, incom uh, incompatible uh, desires. So uh, we believe that schooling is a tool for equality, and uh, in the book, I quote. Uh, Barack Obama, H, uh, W. Bush, uh, Clinton, H. W. Bush, Reagan, etc., extolling uh, schooling as the the key to opportunity and to equality. But at the same time, uh, if you know any high school kids who are going through the college application process, you know it's the exact opposite of of a system of, of equality. What those kids are doing when they are trying so hard and working so hard and devoting their lives to this collegiate admissions game rat race, they're working hard to make themselves unequal, right? In other words, when they go to sit down and fill out that application, the last thing that they want to do is prove that they're equal to other students. They want to prove that they're exceptional, right? And that those two things cannot be resolved. It cannot be both a system for sorting people into different hierarchies of ability and then doling out reward based on that hierarchy, and at the same time be a system that creates socioeconomic equality. So yeah, yeah, right. You you quote, uh, for example, Barack Obama saying uh, that uh, a world class education is the best uh, anti poverty program. Uh, but the obvious problem with that is that even though being academically successful and rising through that kind of professional managerial class rat race can of course be a way out of poverty for lots of individuals. Right. Uh, definitionally, it can't for, for everybody, right? I mean, like this is, this is you know, what I take you talking about when you say you know, that this combination of goals is incoherent. It's the, uh, it's the Lake Wobegon thing, right? All the children are above average right. uh, because, if, um, because if everybody for example, when, went to college, right? If, if, we, if we engineered it such that every single human being in the United States, uh, by the time they were in their mid-20s, had a college degree, that wouldn't mean that everybody got the college wage premium. 
in fact, by, by necessity, the college wage premium would evaporate, right? Uh, a advantage that everyone has in a market no longer becomes an, an advantage, right? Uh, the, right now, again, a diploma is a symbol of inequality. It says, I'm not like those other workers. Those other workers who are applying for their job, they don't have a diploma or my diploma is fancier than theirs is. So that's why you should hire me, right? That is a, a, a symbol of inequality. If we were to uh, make sure that everybody got a degree, the college wage premium would collapse. And, we, and it's essential to say, we don't just know this uh, reasoning from first principles, but we have empirical confirmation of this. So in 2007, the National Bureau of Economic Research put out a huge and really important paper. And it looked at the college wage premium from 1890 to 2005, so a truly large and robust data set. And they found that, uh, and, and these are their words, to a remarkable degree, to a remarkable degree, um, the college wage uh, uh, premium can be explained by a simple ratio between the number of people who have degrees, which is a downward pressure, and the number of jobs that require degrees, which is an upward pressure, which means if you flood the market with more and more and more degree holders, then they're simply competing against each other and, and, and their relative advantage goes away. And we can see this in macrocosm as well as macrocosm. So uh, it must have been six or seven years ago now, but uh, the New Republic put out a great piece uh, once where it looked at pharmacy education. And what had happened was that uh, a number of people had noticed that pharmacy had a robust job market, that, that people with pharmacy degrees were doing well in the job market. Uh, so colleges uh, responded to this. And in fact, there were dozens and dozens, I believe nearly a hundred um, in the span of 10 years, new pharmacy schools were opened at new schools. So you've opened all these new schools, you've got all these new graduates. Surprise, surprise, the new graduates found that in fact, it wasn't a very good job market. They in fact found it a very tight labor market. Why? Because they were all competing against each other, right? When you flood the market with something, whatever it is, in this case, it was people with credentials to be a pharmacist, then the value of that thing drops. And, and it's a perfect example of how uh, you know, it's a microcosm of this broader system where what is seen as being an absolute advantage is only a relative advantage. And if you were to actually su succeed in giving everybody a degree, then we would be cutting out the legs from the very economic advantage that people extol. Yeah, you can't, you can't have a comparative advantage if, uh, if everybody has it. There, there needs to be something that, that you're being compared to that gives you an edge in the labor market uh, so you can have uh, the skills and... Uh, or oftentimes with diplomas, not even these skills, just like some sorting mechanism, right? Even, even if it doesn't necessarily mean anything in terms of underlying skills. And the same point applies to the sort of cliched thing about, oh, you know, if you don't like your, your low-wage job, right? You should learn to code. Everybody learns to code. That doesn't magically create more coding jobs. It does destroy the market value of uh, knowing how to code. And And one way to think about all this is that because this, this point should be fairly obvious, right? Like, you know, you just mentioned and you get into the book, some empirical support for uh, the college wage premium um, only only holding, right, if it's relative, but it's also just kind of common sense, right? You know, that, that you, only, you only get a good advantage in the labor market from having something if not everybody has it, which makes you wonder why it is that all of these uh, liberal and conservative politicians, you know, treat education uh, as if it could solve poverty, when even in principle, that doesn't necessarily make sense. And it seems like one way to think about it is that if you, if you grant that not everybody is going to be academically and professionally successful, uh, then you have to say that when you say that your idea of justice is meritocracy, you know, that you want the smartest and most talented people uh, or the people who are the smartest, most talented, certain narrow ways that are relevant to this discussion, uh, to have all the material rewards and live the good life. And it's not unjust for people who aren't smart or talented uh, to, to, you know, are academically or pretty successful to not have those things. 
uh, then it better be possible for everybody to have them. Because otherwise, if you just grant that some people have these things more than others, uh, and there's a lot of discussion in the book about, um, about behavioral genetics and the evidence that there's a, a, a heritable component of this, uh, but even without that, I think most people in most contexts, uh, especially if they're not thinking about these education debates, would grant that just like beauty or potential athletic ability or height or anything else, uh, the, the cluster of cognitive abilities that go into to academic success are not evenly distributed throughout the population. It'd be really weird if they were. That'd be very contrary to our everyday experience. But if you grant that they're unequally distributed, but then you still say that the people who have more of them uh, should have all the good things in life, that like as long as nobody's being prevented by racism or sexism or anything else from rising through the ranks, then everything's good. Then, you know, just to kind of put it crassly, you've sort of admitted that your utopia is the science fiction movie Gattaca. Yeah, I mean, a, a, a perfectly realized meritocracy is one of the most hideously unjust things I can imagine, right? Because again, as, as soon as we ad, as assert that any part of outcomes is not within the control of the individual, the teacher, the parent, then uh, it becomes a rigged game, right? Um, the, the genetic research that I, that I describe it, uh, has been a convert, controversial part of the book. I knew that it would be. But I would just say to anyone, look, let's say that, it, that it's not genetic at all. Let's, let's just say for the sake of argument that there's a no student side factor at all, that, that outcomes are 100% environmental. Um, the fact that outcomes are influenced by, by environment does not mean that those things can be changed. Right. In other words, so there's what they call the um, unshared environment in behavioral genetics, which is sort of a code word for just all the stuff of life that is untrackable. Right. All the all the thing, you know, a kid you know goes to the library one day and becomes ex uh, inspired. His parents divorce and it puts him into a downward academic spiral. Uh, he meets a new mentor who brings him to new heights. Uh, he, you know, he happens to take to miss the bus one day and misses out on an important lesson. All the stuff that we can't track, that we can't correct for, is part of what makes us uh, who we are academically. And that's there's a strong force, there's a, there's a powerful influence from those sort of things. And even things that we can track and that we uh, have a fairly certain idea about how they impact things are not things we can necessarily change. So I'll give you two examples. One is prematurity. So it turns out that premature babies, very low birth weight babies, um, as a class, of course there's exceptions, but as a class, they have significant negative impacts on their academic performance. And we've got high quality meta studies to demonstrate that. The fact that that is not genetic doesn't mean we can fix it, right? The fact that it is environmental doesn't mean we can change it. In fact, the opposite is going to happen because as medical science progresses, we're going to be able to save more and more premature babies and very low birth weight babies, which means that we're going to have more in our population of kids and, and that problem is going to assert itself more fully. Um, yeah, and, and, and I mean, you're, you're talking about things that are not only, of course, beyond the control of the individual student, but, uh, but beyond the control of the school which is a big part of the book because quite a bit of what you're doing is defending teachers and teachers unions, you know, uh, mm -hmm. that both by marshalling empirical evidence that a lot of the claims that we hear that, oh, if we only, um, you know, busted up teachers unions, if, if it was only easier to fire them, if we had more charter schools, mm -hmm. then that would get us to the Lake Wobegon utopia. Uh, and and you you show many many ways that like that's empirically flawed, uh, but also just just the just the premise that we should be our first instinct should be to blame teachers uh, when when students aren't successful, uh, and that's so ingrained that it's it's actually hard for a lot of people to question. But you have this nice analogy in the book about uh, about widgets, right? If you if you work at a factory where you produce widgets. And you're told that um, that you're going to be fired if if any of the the widgets malf malfunction, uh, but uh, you don't have um, you're only going to 
be with the widget for six hours a day, then other people are going to take them home and they're going to do whatever they're going to do to the widget. You know, that's not going to be under your control. Uh, there's going to be, you know, the, the widget wasn't originally made with you. You only put together certain components. Uh, and, and if we can see why that's unjust, right, that, that, that would be an insane thing to tell people uh, that, oh, that this is going to be, you're going to be fired if anything happens to this thing that is influenced by a thousand factors under your control. It's, it's very odd that we think that teachers um, should uh, be, you know, given no, uh, no job security, that, you know, that they, that they should be fired if students are for any reason academically unsuccessful. So my favorite piece of research, my favorite like moment when I was researching the, the book and I found something I felt was remarkable. So it was in a position paper from Rand, uh, at Rand Education, part of the Rand Corporation, which is very much a neoliberal, pro-charter, pro-teacher uh, uh, merit pay, pro-making it easier to fire teachers uh, shop. Um, they put out a, a piece that, the, talking about why teachers were so important. Buried in that piece, there was an aside, which said, um, although uh, research shows that uh, student and parent side factors are four to eight times more powerful than teacher and school side factors, arguably it is easier to influence teachers and that is where the policy attention belongs. Okay. In other words, like, and to me, like, that's like saying the quiet part loud. You're not supposed to come out and say, well, we can't fix the stuff that's actually wrong, but we do have these convenient receptacles for our ire. So let's, let's, let's go get those teachers, right? It's just, a, it's like, uh, it is a classic example of, you know, the person who only has a hammer, so they see a world of nails, right? Um, teachers are subject to our policy apparatus and so they become the locus of all of this stuff meanwhile parenting you'd think parenting would be a much bigger deal than it is in the educational conversation but there's no policy fix we don't take kids away from their parents because we think they're bad at rearing their kid to be smart right, right. Um, we don't have that kind of influence so everything gets piled onto teachers and schools despite Again, as, as admitted by Rand uh, Education, among, among others, uh, the fact that teachers and schools just don't control that much of the outcomes of student uh, academic ability. Yeah, uh, and even if you did accept that premise that, that the teachers uh, have a much bigger role, a lot of this stuff is, is strange on its face, right? I mean, as you point out in the book, uh, normally, we think that if it's really important to draw the most skillful people to a certain profession, uh, that, that we really want to incentivize people who are good at it doing it, which is what you'd want to do, right, if, if you think this is really important, it would be a really strange strategy to try to do that by demonizing that profession, uh, making it harder for people in that profession to bargain for better wages and working conditions, making it easier to fire them because most human beings, when they're choosing a career path, wouldn't find those things attractive. I mean, ordinarily, if your argument is that a profession suffers from a talent deficit, do you think we need to get more talented people in that profession? What you would do is make that profession more attractive to right. potential applicants where we do literally the opposite with teachers, which is we say, okay, um, we're gonna get rid of your tenure and your job security, uh, but uh, please come make $32,000 to teach 32 kids in one class and you know, grind away at the, the depredations of their poverty and their uh, unstable home lives, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, uh, and, and you do get into, in the last, um, in the last couple of chapters of the book, right, after, after sort of trying to lay out why meritocracy uh, would be extremely undesirable, even if it was possible, um, and, and why um, this idea that students are infinitely malleable, right, to, you know, kind of denying the evidence from common sense, whatever you think the distribution is of genetics and shared mm -hmm. environment and unshared environment and bringing that about, uh, the obvious fact is that 
um, academic talent is as unevenly distributed as the athletic talent. Right? You know, right. nobody nobody thinks that um, that like a, a really really good coach would be able to make any random student a star quarterback. Right. Uh, and and we think it was bizarre if anybody did think that, right? You know, and so if you if you accept that, uh, then you you're not going to want a society in which um, in which just lacking, you know, in which all the good things in life are distributed to you based on this thing that is to a great extent, not a total extent, but a very great extent, uh, not under your control. Uh, and then you, you kind of switch in the last couple chapters of the book to, to at least starting to think uh, about what better solutions would be. So uh, one thing that you'll sometimes hear from conservatives who are maybe half sympathetic to some of your claims, certainly not the ones about charter schools and teachers unions and all of that, right? But, uh, but, but to, to the claim, for example, that um, that advanced education shouldn't be a universal uh, requirement, you know, for, for living the good life. Uh, and some conservatives, you know, will talk that way. I remember back in, God, was it 2012, Rick Santorum made a big deal about how not everybody, you know, should be able to go to college, but then you ask them what their solution is. Uh, and uh, it's, all, it's often like, oh, we should have more, uh, more vocational training. We should have more apprenticeship programs. Uh, and you're fairly clear in the book that you don't think any of this is going to work. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that one thing that we should bear in mind is that nobody dreamed up this system where, um, to a remarkable extent, the ability to secure basic material needs and comfort is dependent upon your performance in school. Less than 100 years ago, college was still, to an incredible extent, finishing school for a money delete. Right. It was a uh, extremely uh, uh, rare thing to be someone who went to college. Um, college was not associated with the job market. So for much of the, the history of higher education, the idea that it was primarily vocational, it, was, it just didn't exist. Like, that idea is very much a post GI Bill kind of an idea. Um, and so, you know, you take these what, what have been feudal institutions for a very, very long time. Uh, you, uh, who, which were based on exclusivity and existed to, to exclude many kinds of people. For example, as we know, the Ivy League was in a decades long conspiracy to exclude Jewish students. You then uh, opened the floodgates to a whole new class of people. Again, the GI Bill was a, a big part of this as was loosening, loosening um, uh, acceptance standards, admission standards in the 1960s and 70s. So now you have a much larger population than you ever have. You have new schools popping up all the time to meet the, the demand. And now at the same time as all this is happening, we are in the very beginning stages of deindustrialization. So automation and offshoring of the, you know, factory at the edge of town job where, you know, I mean, I, I live in Connecticut where there's lots of defense contractors and I have friends who's, uh, parents work it, at those factories where they, they went right after they got a high school diploma and they were able to, you know, own a home, have two cars in a garage and put their kids through college. So all these things happen. We've got a democratized and growing base of people going to college. And at the same time, we have uh, the demise of the uh, steady blue collar job that many people work for uh, in the mid midpoint of the 20th century. Um, I don't know if any individual person would ever say, okay, let's put all the pressure on college to carry the slack of rescuing all these people who have been left behind by macroeconomic changes. But um, we kind of blundered into it. And now people justify it and defend it because, well, very often they succeeded in that system. And so they want to uh, argue for its, uh, its righteousness but also they can't think of an alternative. Yeah, and, and so if the alternative is just send people to more vocational programs, if, if they're not good at, you know, at, at college, one problem is you already pointed out and you point out in the book is that um, oftentimes 
the effect of that uh, is, is just going to be trying to chase the labor market, in fact, trying to chase parts of the labor market that change the most quickly or most vulnerable mm -hmm. to you know, the twists and turns of economic changes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that can't be it, right? So mm -hmm. um, at, at the end, you, know, you basically suggest uh, that you know, the solution has to be redistributive um, both in terms of things that can happen in the short term, right? You know, you have a discussion in there about some of the intra-left debates about whether it would be better to have a universal basic income or a, a uh, universal federal jobs guarantee, and you come down on the side of these things both have advantages and disadvantages, but God, either one would be so much better yeah. uh, than what we have right now. Uh, but, but ultimately you say, you know, what we really need uh, is to do something about capitalism itself, that, uh, that if, if the problem is the basic structure and trying to get people to rise within that structure uh, is gonna have some severe built-in limits, not least of which is that structurally not everybody can be on top, right? If nothing else, we'd all starve to death because nobody would be growing food and taking it to grocery stores, you know, and, and all of that stuff. So, so what we ultimately need to do is, is, to, to have, um, is to have a different structure, to have socialism. Yeah, I mean, I, so I, I guess I would put it this way. When you have a rigged game, the thing that you should really do is to unrig the game. I mean, that's the long-term project. And the long-term project that I, I think we need to do is to unrig the game by changing our fundamental social system because um, I just, I think in, massive inequality is an inevitable outcome of a uh, market economy. Um, but that obviously is not something we can wage a magic wand and have happen tomorrow. Right. So if you can't unrig the game, one thing that you can do is you can lower the game stakes. So in other words, you can make it less harmful to someone who fails in the cult of smart, someone who doesn't do well in the meritocratic grind up the ladder. You can make it so that their lives are more pleasant by and safe by having redistributive programs, enacting some sort of a Scandinavian social welfare state so that um, being uh, a loser stings a lot less than it does now. Because, you know, at an extreme, people who who really can't succeed in in the this hierarchy in this competition you know there's a lot of them now who live lives in in you know uh, rotting cities in the rust belt where they uh make a living by with a, a phony disability claim and who are addicted to opioids and who have sky high uh, alcoholism and suicide rates i mean it really is at high stakes uh what we're talking about today it really is for a lot of people a, a, a life or death question about whether or not they can get into a good college and get a good job afterwards. And so that's gotta, that's gotta be something that we change. We have to make it so that you can, you can fail and be free to fail and you say, Oh, you know what? I can still pay my rent. Yeah. That the, the price uh, of failure shouldn't be economic uh, devastation. Uh, and, and I think one way to think about that is to imagine that there was some other set of skills uh, that, that, uh, that uh, the distribution of resources was as based on as the distribution of resources is based on this kind of narrow academic ability uh, for anybody who's not born into circumstances where, um, you know, if you're, if you're born you know, if you're born into the Walton family or something, it, it doesn't matter how bad you are at school, right? Maybe it matters to you because we've valorized this so much uh, at the expense of other values, but it certainly doesn't matter to you economically. Uh, but, but for so many other people, going into this professional managerial rat race, right, is the only way to get a good life. And we can imagine a society where it was something else that, you know, it, that, uh, you had to, that we had like singing contests where, you know, where uh, the people with the most beautiful singing voices uh, were, um, were awarded all the good things in life and, and people who, uh, who did the worst, you know, just had to, to live in poverty. 
Um, and, you know, I know I would be screwed, right? I can't carry a tune to, you know, mm. to save my life. Uh, and maybe with diligent practice that could, that could be corrected to some extent. Uh, but probably nobody thinks that musical talent uh, is innately evenly distributed through the population, that if you just want it badly enough, right, everybody uh, could, could be a great singer uh, in the way that we often seem to feel that, uh, that academic talent is. And, and the reason this is important uh, is has to do with stuff that you got into in the book, which um, you know I was also not not expecting. Since usually, even though um, you know I went to graduate school in philosophy and in a very analytic kind of philosophy uh, program, but usually when I read leftist books, if there's philosophy in there, it's you know, critical theory or something. But uh, in in this case, there was actually quite a bit of the, the kind of philosophy uh, that that I'm more used to in there. Uh, so, uh, so for example, you, you have an extended discussion about uh, John Rawls and the veil of ignorance, if you want to speak to that for a minute. Yeah, just, um, <clears throat> I think that if we accept that natural talent is real, then that is the, in, a, in anything, right? Like, we don't have to restrict ourselves to academic talent here, like the ability to be an NFL running back, if we think that there's some sense of natural talent in there. That to me, if we believe that not everyone is equal in their abilities from birth, right? In other words, that we are born unequal to others in certain ways as individuals. That uh, that is the ultimate expression of Rawls's idea of you know uh, the veil of ignorance and saying, if what would I really want to join join a society in which such an enormous value is placed on the ability to succeed in school? if I didn't know if I was going to have a natural inclination to be good at that. And I also would just would note, um, even aside from talent, there's also temperament. So right. one, one of the things that, you know, there are many people who have the mental capacity to succeed in school, but who flat don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. And I encountered many students in my, in my collegiate teaching career who would say right off the bat that they didn't want to be in, in, in school anymore, and it wasn't for them, that they knew that they hated it, but they just felt they had no place else to go. There were no outs for them. There was no factory at the edge of town that they could go to. And, uh, and, and so temperament matters too. And it's a, a tremendously inefficient uh, thing. If kids that don't want to be in college uh, anymore, don't want to be in college, um, are cluttering our classes, uh, frustrating their teachers, accumulating tens of thousands of dollars in student loan debt, and in general, uh, taking up space that they would rather not occupy themselves. And once upon a time, 50 years ago, it would have been unthinkable for a kid like that to go to college because not everybody went to college and that was fine. It was a normal thing to do to not go to college. Um, but unfortunately, um, uh, things changed and now there's a deep-seated sense of inadequacy to people who don't go to college often even if they are people who are, are proud of their own choices and proud of the path that they've taken um, it really is deeply ingrained into our society that um, smart people go to college and smart is more important than anything else yeah definitely I mean this is something um, you know we're talking a little bit about on uh, social media uh, late last night and, and this morning that, you know, something that the book made me think about a lot actually is how thoroughly my life has been influenced by, you know, the cult of smart, right? Right. Really seeing this as, as the defining human virtue, you know, I, I mentioned graduate school earlier, right. And, and I think, uh, I think certainly that's a context where in my experience, especially doing philosophy where, um, there's, there's really very little pretense to uh, having some instrumental value uh, to the intellectual exercise, uh, even really adding to knowledge in the usual, in the usual sense of that, right? Because you're not really researching things, uh, you're arguing about them. And so when you get a bunch of people together who are uh, enthusiastic obsessives in that pursuit, as you kind of have to be to try to be trying to get a PhD in philosophy, uh, then you, you end up with a lot of kind of unhealthy valorization of this because 
even though you're taking a subset of the population where you're you're already right i mean this is this tiny tiny portion of people who are interested enough in abstract intellectual things that you would want to do this with your life um you know you you end up obsessing about variations within that group you know to to uh to judge and, and informally sort people right so so i kind of think back to how much i used to judge people on how quick on their feet they were and you know answering a question you know after, after a talk um you know, I, I think it really speaks to this because we don't think about intelligence. And again, intelligence is a vague term. It means lots of different things. You know, you're very clear on this in the book that you're talking narrowly about the kinds of intelligence that are most likely to be rewarded in the kind of um, neoliberal capitalism, you know, that, that we live under. But we don't think of intelligence the way that we think of other kinds of abilities. Uh, uh, or other kinds of things that we might valorize to to one extent or another, right? You know, we, you know, we appreciate people being good looking, right? But like we would feel some appropriate trepidation about judging somebody's overall human worth on how good looking we were, right? We appreciate right. a good singing voice, right? You know, but we don't judge somebody uh, to to be worthless on the basis of not being able to carry a tune, uh, and. We certainly wouldn't think that it was justice for society to be structured such that the consequences of not having one of these virtues uh, would be misery and, and, and destitution um, uh, and, and everything that you're describing, which certainly resonates, you know, having grown up in mid-Michigan, you know, in a college town, but around, uh, around a lot of symptoms of post-industrial decay. Um, that, that we wouldn't think that was appropriate. So in those last sections of the book that I kind of started to ask you about earlier, uh, you, you talk about, as you say, unrigging the game or just playing a different game, right? You know, like, right. like say we, we shouldn't be assigning people stations in life <clears throat> on the basis of whether they have these abilities or not. Uh, but then in the short term, since, since obviously we're not going to skip from what we have right now to like, whatever, fully automated luxury communism. So in the short term, talk about having it sting a little bit less. And, uh, and you talk about several ways that we could do that. So uh, like one of them, it's probably the example that's most familiar to people, but I think it's worth like underlining and circling the connection uh, is, uh, is having universal health care uh, because, because that as, as much as, I don't know, maybe if you've been around certain kind of lefty political discourse, you've heard so much about uh, Medicare for all in the last five years that, you know, it, it's almost like, oh, boring, right? Everybody knows that, right? But like, you, you do make a really compelling case in the book for why this is an important part of while we're getting around to completely disassembling this rat race game, uh, how to at least make the price of not succeeding in that game less brutal than it is right now. Yeah, I mean, I think I think an essential part of talking about Medicare for all or single payer is um, obviously the most important thing is that people have access to medical care when they need it. Everyone does, regardless of their social economic status. But I think it's really important for people to understand um, employer based health insurance, which is the system we met more or less have or the majority of people have. Uh, is an incredible disincentive for people to shop around for jobs and try to find something else to do. If you're in a terrible, for many, many people, they might be in a terrible situation at work that makes them miserable uh, and they might want to quit and head out and find something better, but they can't because they can't afford to give up their health insurance. So health insurance is a way in which employers uh, uh, institute labor discipline and keep people from looking around for something new. I mean, if we acknowledge that people have different, uh, everyone has different strengths and different weaknesses, then we should uh, encourage people to have a period where they're just looking for the thing that they do well. I mean, one of the great inequalities between college students and people who don't go to college is college students have the opportunity to take a, a couple years and say, what do I really want to be? What excites me? Where are my natural talents lie? If you're someone who at 18 graduates from high school and heads immediately to the job market, you don't have that luxury because you need to start paying the bills immediately, right? And so uh, we're depriving people of the ability to find their niche in the economy 
which is not only harsh on them, but I would say is the source of inefficiency for the economy writ large because we're not effectively matching people to their to the, their best employment. Yeah, and, and even uh, even people who don't have to go straight into the job market at 18, right? You know, that who do who do go to college where in theory uh, and to some extent in practice, right? You know, the, you know, part of the value of that is that you can spend some time exploring and figuring out what you're good at. Mm -hmm. um, that a lot of the educational trends that, that we've seen, you know, recent decades are towards narrowing the amount of room uh, that, that there is for that, right? So there, there's this widespread mythology that uh, the reason that, you know, college graduates aren't uh, getting as much economic benefit from it as they should be uh, is that uh, these dumb kids are, are off majoring in French poetry, you know, when, when they should be uh, studying business or STEM fields. Uh, and, and so, like, really, we, we need less uh, less exploration, right? Less, you know, sort of floating around and figuring out what you like and figuring out what we're good at and more practicality. But as you point out in the book, that that picture uh, that's that's very common, you know, that we hear really has nothing to do with what the statistics tell us about what actually goes on in college. I mean, the, the, the claim that people take impractical majors is based on a completely, on a d definition of practical that is uh, meaningless. So, the number one major uh, is business. Business would appear to me to be on the surface as practical of a major as you can get. Uh, it's, uh, we, we graduate three times as many business majors every year as we do every other, as we do this, the second highest major. So it's an enormous number of students. 350,000 business majors come onto the job market every year off of college. It turns out that business majors have the middling performance metrics in terms of their uh, unemployment rate and their and their income. Um, you would might find that weird if your worldview is based on the idea that well some majors are practical and they get rewarded and some aren't and so they don't get rewarded. But in fact, it's what we should expect. We would expect that the median major would also have the median outcomes, right? In other words. All those business majors are competing against themselves. Those 350,000 business majors that come onto the market every year have enormous competition from all the rest of them. So of course their, their numbers don't look particularly great. And which again gets back to this thing, if everyone takes practical majors, right, the practicality of those majors will go down. And I also challenge anyone to look at the list of the top 10 majors and, and, and find that it is particularly uh, uh, impractical. I mean, nursing is on there, and nursing is, I think, a hugely practical major with a path to a, a, a good union job. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and I think that uh, one of the most uh, compelling parts of, of the book um, is, is the part that in, in some of the uh, reviews that I've seen um, from, from people on the right, uh, you know, there's one in the National Review, there's this one from you know, Andrew Sullivan, who I guess sort of ambiguously a uh, centrist now, I don't know, whatever he is, yeah. um, you know, that they sort of don't know what to do with uh, is, is the part at the very end about how really the solution to a non, you know, rat race based economy, an economy, uh, a, a system, right, where people can live up to their potential without, without trying to uh, chase employer desires is to not have society divided into employees and employees at all, right? To, uh, to have socialism. Uh, and, and I guess what I just wanted to close with uh, is this, that, that one thing I found, uh, find fascinated about this is that some people have this reaction uh, to, to the book and you, you've expressed that some people even had the reaction when you told them you're writing the book, mm -hmm. that there's some sort of disconnect between saying that there is a uneven distribution of various kinds of talents, uh, that, you know, that we're not equal in that sense, right? That we all, that we all have equal uh, natural endowments uh, and, and saying that we should uh, care about the kind of you know, economic equality and you know, the sense in which socialism is or isn't about equality exactly is complicated, but you know, that, we should, that we should be opposed to meritocracy per se um, 
which, uh, which is funny for, for at least two reasons, right? One is one you really emphasize in the book, which is that normally we think the most, the more progressive position on, it, uh, on anything that some people think is, is really up to you, it's just your free will, it's just whether you want it enough. And other people think, no, 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 to a large extent, this beyond your control is to go with the, it's beyond your control position, to be more sympathetic to people who, who don't have that thing, right? Because, because they, it's not just because they didn't want it enough. And then the other reason is that it's very far from the true that historically everybody who's, who's had a critique of capitalism has thought that natural endowments were equal, right? One thing that I, I thought of while I was writing the book, I just want to uh, maybe read you the, the quote and, and get your reaction to it, uh, is uh, Karl Marx in his uh, critique of the Gotha program uh, he is criticizing a rival faction within the German socialist movement, the Lasallians, uh, who, among other reasons, the sort of complicated ideological differences between these two factions, uh, the Lasallians said uh, that our goal should be that everybody gets the full product of their labor, that they're, that they're um, compensated or if we don't have money at this point they're they're you know in whatever way right you know they're rewarded on the basis of their labor contributions because they said oh the unjust thing about capitalism is that the capitalist is is taking is taking his own cut right of what's produced by the workers labor so what we should want is for workers to get the full value of their labor which probably sounds pretty marxist to most people but marx was actually very critical of this idea and in part of his criticism, he says this, this is from chapter one of the critique of the Goth program. But one man is superior to another physically or mentally and thus supplies more labor in the same time or can labor for a longer time. And labor to serve as measure must be designed as its duration or intensity. Otherwise it ceases to be uh, a standard of measurement. This equal right is an unequal right for unequal labor. It recognizes no class differences because everyone is only a worker like everyone else but it tacitly recognizes unequal individual endowment and thus productive capacity as a natural privilege. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I just, in general, I think you've heard from Marx there, also Engels um, uh, independently uh, arrived at the conclusion, equality as such has never been a coherent political goal. Um, equality in the broad sense that people assume when you talk about socialism has never been deeper. I mean, I, I would argue that Marxism's fundamental program is not equality, but rather end to exploitation, right? That's the, an end to the exploitation of worker, worker power and labor value. Um, uh, I'm, I don't care about social mobility. I never have. I, I say why in the book. Um, look, in, in our, our utopian society in the future, some people are still going to be taller than others. Some of them are going to have a better voice. Some of them are going to have more inclination to, ditch, to dig ditches than somebody else is going to have an inclination to dig ditches. There's always going to be inequality. If I talk about equality, I mean equality in terms of the basic necessities of human life being provided equally for all people so that everyone has an equal right to food, clothing, housing, health care, education. Right? That's the equality that matters to me. Um, to say, well, you're acknowledging inequality in people's abilities, but you're asking for equality in their outcomes. I'm not asking for equality in their outcomes because I can't conceive of what that would look like. But what I can conceive of what it would look like is a society in which no one ever has to worry, can I afford to pay for this doctor's visit? Can I afford to pay the rent? Can I afford my food bill? Can I afford to buy clothing? Can I afford to get educated? That's, that's what I'm after, not equality. Thank you so much, Freddie. So the book is The Cult of Smart, How a Broken Education System Perpetuates Social, uh, uh, social Injustice. Uh, really enjoyed this, thought it was one of the most interesting things I've read in a long time. Uh, everybody should, uh, should check that out. Uh, put a, uh, a link in the show notes to, uh, to where you can buy it, ideally from uh, uh, try to you know, I use Amazon when I have to, but uh, there's uh, Red Emma's is a worker-owned bookshop that uh, if you can if you can order it from there, uh, do that. You know, support them. But uh, thank you so much for for coming on. I've been uh, reading your stuff for years. There's a lot of other things that I'd love to talk to you about sometime if you if you come back. But I'm really happy you could come on to talk about this. Thanks so much. I had a, had a great time. All right.
Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. All right. So that was uh, Freddie DeBoer, author of The Cult of Smart, uh, now joined, of course, uh, by a friend, comrade, um, and uh, all around excellent person, uh, David Griscom, uh, for another installment of Outlaws and Revolutionaries. Oh, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm extremely happy that you're, that you're here. So for the first, uh, first few of these, um, sorry, you know, so Griscom's here, gonna follow the rules and uh, switch from, uh, from beer to whiskey. Uh, so uh, for the first few of these, uh, we, we've been going over uh, some of the country legends. Uh, you know, we've, we've talked about uh, Willie Nelson uh, and Johnny Cash and uh, Waylon Jennings uh, last time before the Labor Day break. So who are we gonna talk about today? Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, one of the greats, and not without controversy, uh, but certainly one of the greats in country music, uh, Merle Haggard. And uh, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to say before, but I can just jump into it if you're ready. Well, yeah, I, I will say this, that uh, that last night I, I finished uh, reading Freddie's book, um, which, which ends with this kind of impassioned uh, plea for a society where life outcomes aren't distributed the way they are uh, in the one we live in. And then afterwards, it's pretty late at night, but I was still feeling pretty wired. And uh, you'd sent me a little playlist of, of Merle Haggard songs to, uh, to, to listen to, to, uh, to prep for the segment. Um, and so I, I, you know, I poured some uh, Johnny Walker Black and started listening uh, started listening to to the songs i think starting with uh with mama tried yeah. and uh and and just the way you know like just the kind of poetry of the way that some of these songs like depict the way that that human beings are like mashed up and bent and you know twisted apart uh by by systems like as as a chaser for for Fred de Boer's very like intellectual analysis of the same problem mm -hmm. uh, was you know even though I I would have gotten more sleep if I if I'd skipped it right you know like like I'm I'm, I'm really I'm really happy that I did it. it it was it was a really amazing chaser to that book mm, oh I'm sure no I mean I think like um, obviously when you're talking about musicians it's really important to fix fixate on the work and pay attention to that but Merle Haggard. You know, he really lived uh, a life that was obviously particular to him, um, but it was something that a lot of people were experiencing in that time. And also just like another example, I mean, like his life was seriously affected by, um, you know, by the Great Depression and by the Dust Bowl. You know, he was, you know, he was born in California to two, two parents who had fled the Dust Bowl. You know, one of these horrible stories, but all too common in American history of people basically being forced out of their homes, being forced out of like their communities, uh, traditions and sort of you know thrown in to be low wage wager uh, yeah low wage uh, workers in a you know completely foreign place to them um, you know I don't know like Merle like you know just for people who aren't familiar with that history like Merle Haggard as I said his parents were you know from Oklahoma but they left during the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression he grew up in a box car uh, in California you know and he was living um, you know a very harsh life and I think one of these things because we're so um there's so many decades that have passed that people actually don't realize for example like the word oki how offensive uh that term was it was a term um that was definitely used as a slur to dehumanize people and to you know treat them like dirt to say that they don't have the same kind of minds or capabilities as other people and that was sort of the excuse that you know the wealthy people in california were able to come up with for why there was this massive population of people who are you know picking uh agricultural products and, you know, working low wage jobs who were basically living in shanty towns um, and in labor camps all across the state. Um, you know, I'm just yeah. like a real serious story that affected him and obviously his music. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, most, most obviously, uh, Oki from Muskogee. Yeah, we'll get to that in a second, but, you know, I just wanted to, to start with some things for people who aren't familiar with it. Like, you know, Merle Haggard, uh, you know, grew up in this kind of extreme state of poverty. There aren't a lot of opportunities. And, you know, he, he, he was a criminal. He was a thief. Um, he was arrested and he spent a long period of his youth in jail. Um, 
Um, he got out of jail in 1960, but before that, he actually was one of the prisoners in Johnny Cash's famous uh, San Quentin um, performance. Merle Haggard was in the audience watching that, uh, watching that performance. You know, there's a lot of stories about how that was sort of, you know, the catalyst that changed his life. I don't know if that was the one a moment in his life that changed it, but for sure, um, you know, that's such a, you know, fascinating coincidence you find when you, especially with country music, there are so many just incredible uh, coincidences like that. But, you know, like the song Mama Tried, which is one of my favorite songs of mm -hmm. all time, you know, it's obviously a story about somebody who is sort of dealing with the fact that they're 20, they just turned 21 in prison. They're doing life without parole and they're just sort of, you know, it's a sweet uh, homage uh, to their, to their mother who tried their very, very best, but, you know, the world, uh, didn't work out that way for him and that's why he has to spend his life in prison but a lot of his other prisoner songs um are a bit more radical and interesting especially in the context of what we're doing in this country right now like branded man um is mm -hmm. a phenomenal song and that's a song that he wrote you know a few years out of prison um and one of the main the opening lyric goes i'd like to hold my head up and be proud of who i am but they won't let my secret go untold i paid the debt i owed them but they're still not satisfied now i'm branded man out in the cold and, you know, the history of American capitalism is so tied to our prison system and to our legal system here and how a lot of these like, you know, low wage workers, people who didn't have opportunities were basically, you know, put into these kind of like, you know, prison camps and forced to work. Um, and then out of work, they were, you know, they had that brand on them forever and they weren't able to find opportunities because, you know, it had a way of following them across um, you know, across state and county lines and, and time. Yeah, I just, I, I just saw uh, yesterday, I think, uh, that uh, the governor of California, uh, Gavin Newsom, who, who's somebody who, who often seems like he was uh, grown in a lab uh, by uh, <laughs> some sort of cabal of like bloodless centrist Democrats, uh, you know, he, he did do a good thing, but it's, it's like kind of an odd good thing because there's, there's been all this attention paid uh, given the, the apocalyptic uh, fires going on in the West Coast uh, to inmate firefighters. So uh, he did this order to uh, expunge the records of inmate firefighters so you know, they, could, they could get uh, jobs you know, as, as, uh, as firefighters you know, when they got out, yeah. uh, which of course just highlights uh, what branded man is about, uh, because like okay, okay, that that's nice for them, mm -hmm. right? You know, like what about every other human being in the prison system uh, who is branded by this? Which uh, beyond like the the kind of just just wonky like policy thing you can say, which is that if your goal was to create a permanent criminal class, this is how you would do it mm. by denying people future non-criminal employment, but like also just on a human level, like, you know, what you get in the song is, is, is just an astonishingly evil thing to do to people. Oh, hundred percent. And, you know, and like, I think most people listening to this would already be familiar with the arguments, but the, the point is that you go to prison to serve your time to learn your lesson. You should be able to come out to society and have, you know, the same kind of opportunities as everyone else and you know it's just one of those things that is disheartening but it's sort of you know th there are a lot of people that we can draw on in our fight um you know that it, it was the same way in the 1960s as it is in 2020 and just like on the prison um stuff because i actually want to take it a little different direction to remember him some other aspects that people yeah. might not be familiar um there's a really other great song that i i selected too uh, you know about prison called sing me back home and that's a really beautiful song about somebody um it's a tragic song about somebody who is um, you know, about to face their death, be execution by the state, um, executed by the state. And uh, they turn to Merle Haggard or, you know, the singer in the song, and they ask him just playing one more song to remind them of back home, um, which is something that on a universal level you can understand. But if you also remember that in California, so many of these people who were caught up in these prison systems, they weren't like, you know, there was the place that they lived and maybe even were born, but, you know, Oklahoma or Texas, all these places that they had left was really, you know, the kind of idea of home um, for them. So it's a really beautiful song there. It's definitely worth a listen. And it's also worth noting too on the political aspect with Merle. Um, you know, he wasn't somebody that I would argue like had done like a tremendous amount of advocacy, like, you know, like you mean being directly involved in movements. But, you know, there was a really horrible uh, story that came out in the 1970s um, and from Arkansas, Cummings Prison Farm, 
um, where they found a bunch of bodies that had been buried on the property, which obviously the story there goes is that they were just killing inmates with no thought or reason um, to it. And Merle Haggard at that point was very big, uh, you know, with his career, he's one of the most famous country music uh, artists in the country. And he spent a lot of time advocating for that. So that's something that was very important uh, to Merle throughout his life was standing up for prisoners. But I just wanted to hit on two songs, and I'm sorry I realized I didn't send them to you before, but there's a really beautiful song that he wrote. It's not as famous, um, called They're Tearing the Labor Camps Down. Mm -hmm. And it's a song about him returning, basically, to the area that he grew up. And uh, one of, the, one of the, uh, the verses go, oh, they're tearing their labor camps down, and I feel a little sentimental shame. Where's a hungry man going to go live at in this town? Oh, they're tearing the labor camps down. And... You know, in a lot of ways, it's like, you know, and if you listen to the song or more like all these, anyone who has the sentiment, I think like they're not arguing that like that kind of life was good or preferable. Right. But they are. There was this realization that has very much become uh, the story in this country. We're like, where is there a place to get a job? Where is there a kind of opportunity for me? I mean, as we were saying earlier, for a lot of these people who, you know, were just stuck in the, uh, the criminal system, it's like, well, it's just crime. Um, or really horrible jobs. And with those, you can't really find any kind of, uh, you know, housing for you. So, you know, that's in 1972 um, that he was, that he was writing that. And, you know, he, he wrote a lot of really great songs that are working man's ballads. And you know, it's a lot of them sort of what we we're talking about with uh, Waylon Jennings last week, in my opinion, really embody a kind of really great American working class uh, spirit. You know, it's not fully developed as any kind of like socialist consciousness or anything like that, but it's clear like, you know, there are people who are screwing us. W what do we have? We have our ability to look out for each other and to work very hard, right? And, uh, you know, it, it is something that, you know, it gives me a lot of, uh, you know, um, happiness to listen to somebody, you know, seeing those, somebody who comes from a similar background, um, not being an okie or anything like that, but, you know, growing up poor. Um, you know, like that kind of camaraderie is just, it's, it's throughout all of Merle's work, even in the kind of songs that people, uh, you know, attack him for now today on the left. But um, yeah, I don't know. He was a absolutely incredible, you know, ballad of, of a kind of working class perspective at a time when, you know, the forces of, of capitalism were very clear, the ecological destruction of, uh, you know, that, that occurred from the Dust Bowl uh, to the Great Depression and then to this horrible period of exploitation of, of migrant workers in, uh, in the area. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and, and actually also uh, one of the songs that you sent me was uh, Irma Jackson, which uh, is, uh, is like a very uh, explicitly, you know, anti-racist song, mm -hmm. but not in, you know, certainly in, in any sort of like, you know, I'm so enlightened, I'm going to tell you what's what way, but like in the same way uh, that his prison songs do, uh, it's it's something that like really like goes at the pathos of, of what it is to be a, to be a human being mm -hmm. whose, whose life is being distorted by a society that's like this. Um, I mean, certainly like Irma Jackson is a great example of that too, because I mean, it's a love song. It's basically... You know, at a time to, again, it's like, it's so crazy to talk about this because it's what, the 1960s that the song came out, maybe 1970. Um, and I think it was 1971, I might be wrong about that, but that was actually officially released, but he had written and recorded it a lot earlier. You know, but, it, you know, people forget like, you know, interracial relationships were outlawed in large, large uh, parts of the country. And it was basically a song talking about how unbelievably ridiculous this is. One, that it's evil and cruel and just how absurd, like, he, you know, just like the incoherence of the idea that somebody he's known his whole life and loves, you know, tremendously. Now everybody has a problem with, with their relationship now that they're older and they might want to get married. But that's a really good uh, a segue to my defense of Merle Haggard. Um, yes. Because Merle Haggard is much maligned, especially by some people on the left because of some of the songs that he wrote, primarily Oki from Muskoki, which is a great song in my opinion. It's just like musically, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal song. And if people are familiar with that song, the, the offense that people have is that, you know, it was, there was a line about that Okies from Muskogee, they don't burn their trap cards, they don't uh, smoke marijuana, and they're not hippies, basically, right? And obviously, this was at a time of, you know, this massive uh, culture war in the country, obviously, a lot of social unrest over Vietnam. But if you listen to the song, I'll hold on on what actually Merle Haggard said on it, because it actually makes it very clear. But if you actually listen to the song, it's completely incoherent. And that's on purpose because it was a satire song. Now, the reality is when you make music, especially when you make popular music, 
once it goes out into the world, people are going to interpret it in any way that they're, you know, that they want. But the song itself, um, you know, the origins of the song essentially was that they were driving through Muskogee and one of the bandmates said, uh, well, I bet they don't smoke marijuana in Muskogee. Now, it's pretty obvious that somebody probably would just say that randomly in the back of a, <laughs> of a bus. It's very clear that they were all probably partaking in smoking marijuana at the time. And in the line where he's talking about how they don't smoke marijuana in Muskogee, like the next line or maybe two lines after, they say that actually what they do drink, um, what they do enjoy in Muskogee is white lightning, which is moonshine which is illegal, right? So <laughs> the idea of the song, right, is some guy getting up on a high horse about like, we don't do illegal things here while saying like, I only drink illegal whiskey um, or, you know, corn liquor. Um, you know, it's definitely, you know, supposed to be an over the top satirical song. And Merle Haggard has come out and said that. Um, you know, but that, that being said, like there were a lot of aspects of the song that were very important politically, primarily the way that he dealt with the word, um, Oki. Now, I would say that that probably is not a song. I don't think it's a song that's making fun of Okies. Mm. Um, one, it's also important to remember that people from Oklahoma weren't considered to be Okies. Those people, Okies were people who were in California who were forced to leave right. Oklahoma. Um, so that whole idea is, is one thing on itself. But you know what he did is he took a horrible slur that he had been called his whole life and he turned it into something that was very positive. And I think there's no doubt in my mind that the reason that Okie, now I'm sure if you said, said it to the wrong person, um, you know, they probably would still get you, you know, probably get whooped over the head. But, um, you know, that it's lost a lot of its teeth because uh, Merle Haggard was actually able to like reclaim, uh, reclaim this word. But, you know, it's the danger of satire. Um, but I would also add the reason that the Irma Jackson song is such a good segue um, mm. into that song is because when the record company wanted to put out uh, Okie from Muskogee as a single, he wanted on the B side for it to be Irma Jackson. Um, but the record company was absolutely against it because the song had become such a great and considered by the public to be like a right wing anti war protest song. Um, you know, but he had to fight tooth and nail and he didn't get that. Um, and but a couple of years later, he was able to uh, release Irma Jackson as its own a single. But that's just another lesson when we're going through all of these country artists, too is that you gotta remember that these people aren't able to create their music and just like release it under their right. own terms. They're controlled by a you know, fairly reactionary conservative uh, you know, record companies um, that you know, they have political goals too. Um, and you, know, you hear, especially when it comes to people like, and that's why you should respect people like Willie Nelson and Will and Jennings so much because they were so adamant about bucking that trend. But you have to remember that there are a lot of other people pulling the strings. But the fact that I think um, that, you know, he wanted to release Irma Jackson on the same right. you know, record. <laughs> tells you a lot about as OK from Muskogee. He tells you a lot about where he was and this kind of like really simple minded uh, way that some people like look too literally at the lyrics of Ogie from Muskogee um, and then, you know, completely deny all of Merle Haggard's works and what he said about the song, I think is a huge, huge shame. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it, it absolutely is. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we were talking the other night about a um, obituary of, of Merle Haggard in, um, in a, that was, I'll, uh, I'll leave the, uh, the author and venue unspoken, um, you know, out of, out of both consideration and self-interest, that's a hint. Uh, but uh, but it's uh, that that really annoyed both of us, right? You know, because there's there's something there's something that is like really profoundly unhealthy about a left that has a visceral bad reaction to music that is uh, to such a great extent, you know, a, a, about. Um, you know, working class uh, experience, and you know, and 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 about uh, and at about like going through life and dealing with all this garbage, and well, it's 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 a, it's a small thing, but it's not a good sign. No, I, I agree completely, and it's also like not under, uh, honestly, I would say like just on a cultural criticism level, you're making a huge mistake there because you're not understanding like the all the different reasons we make art and and music. If you grow up, you don't even have to be from the south, but I'm sure like there are a lot of people who know the main character from Okie from Muskogee. You know, this kind of like over the top brash guy who wants to pick fights with somebody who, you know, 
talks or acts or dresses a little bit different from them. And, you know, it's, it's poking fun at them a little bit. It's recognizing them. You know, another song, um, too, one day that is like horribly politically wrong and people don't understand either is Redneck Mother by uh, uh, Ray Wiley Hubbard. And that's a song, if you go to Honky Tonks, especially in Texas, they play that over the loudspeakers before the band coming on. And that song is about, you know, some 34 year old guy who's just kicking hippies asses and all these kind of things. And people oftentimes don't understand that that song is very much making fun of that guy, especially the fact that Ray Wiley Hubbard is a guy like me, really long hair, very much like a hippie, you know, kind of, right. you know, alternative lifestyle guy. You know, so he's not the one extolling the virtues of beating up people <laughs> like him, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I, I think that that's something that people need to, to get <laughs> a better head on their shoulders about. Oh, and before I forget, yeah. um, on, on the subject of Oki from Muskogee, uh, somebody who, something I was listening to just in the past couple of days, uh, Tyler Mahan Co., who's the son of David Allen Co., has a wonderful podcast called um, uh, Cocaine and Rhinestones. And he has a whole episode dedicated actually to Oki from Muskogee and like just debunking the idea that it's a right wing song. I highly suggest listening to it. It's also a great podcast across the board. Um, but just in the last second, if you don't mind, yeah, yeah, I wanted to please. just make another great suggestion too on the weed smoking one too. Um, you know, <laughs> Merle Haggard ended up becoming a very pro prolific and out, you know, pot smoker, no doubt because of his very great friendship with Willie Nelson. Right. Um, but they came out with an album that got released in 2015 that I think is phenomenal um, called Django and Jimmy. And it's a joint album between uh, Merle and, um, and, uh, and Willie, including a song that's called It's All Going to Pot. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's definitely you know definitely a, a, a u-turn from Oki from Muskogee um, but that's a great album to check out but I also wanted to to add to close with maybe as a kind of segue into somebody who I'd like to talk about soon in, in yeah. one of these segments um, there's a wonderful song that Merle Haggard popularized but he didn't write called If I Could Only Fly and that was a song written by uh, Blaze Foley um, who people from Austin probably will know very well. He was one of the great, uh, you know, country artists who died very tragically um, too yeah, young I, in, a, in a skirmish, pretty actually close to where I grew up. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I only know him because because uh, I've I've crashed on your couch in Brooklyn, which means that I have heard <laughs> some uh, some plays fully. Uh, but I liked what well, I heard. He's, well, he's a country like he's a country music player, he's a country music artist. And anyways, he, you know, uh, Merle Haggard got famous for writing this song. And he said in an interview one day, I can't remember the magazine, um, that he thought that that was one of the greatest country songs ever written. And Blaze Foley, who never really had a lot of commercial success, was so moved and, you know, proud of that, that he kept rolled up in his boot that magazine article <laughs> and he would pull it out when he had a couple drinks to show people like look what Merle Haggard said about me I'm somebody <laughs> oh that's awesome uh thank you so much David yeah. uh I, I love doing these uh this uh, this is like this is always such a a perfect way to to cap off these episodes so uh who do you want to do next week I think it's Blaze. I think that's the All right. move. All right. Very nice. All right. Well, looking forward to that. Uh, yeah. Thank you as always, brother. All right. Talk to you later. Talk to you later. Bye. All right. Uh, so before uh, we wrap up, uh, I do want to just take a, uh, a few questions because I didn't feel like there was a natural time to, uh, to slip some of these in earlier, but a few things that people asked uh, in uh, the, the Q&A. Um, so uh, Jeremy uh, Salman, I believe, uh, says, uh, what's the coverage of West Coast fires been like elsewhere in the country? Uh, I mean, mostly I, I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of terrifying, you know, kind of apocalyptic, you know, dystopian movie images uh, of, of red and orange skies. Uh, I've been hearing a lot about that from uh, my younger brother. Uh, and his fiance, who uh, who live in California, um, there is a question uh, from Ben Udashin, who, by the way, is the host of a podcast you should check out called "The Unpopular Front." 
uh, about the anniversary uh, on Friday, this last Friday of, uh, of 9-11, uh, and, and how we can, can mark that in a way that's useful to uh, democratic socialist politics. Uh, and, and, I, and that one, you know, is, is a little bit, uh, you know, is a little bit of a tricky issue, right? Because the, the eternal memorialization of this, this tragedy on 9-11 is certainly something that's historically functioned uh, as, as propaganda for uh, these seemingly endless wars uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan and elsewhere, the so-called global war on terror, um, which is uh, continuing to end human lives uh, as we speak, uh, most obviously through the, through the drone program and the forever war uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, but, but I think that we might be getting to a point as a society where enough people are disillusioned enough uh, with that endless imperial warfare uh, that, that, we can, that we can memorialize the tragedy uh, and, and also remember, uh, use it as an occasion to remember the national madness that followed it, the, you know, the shredding of the Constitution, uh, the, uh, the, the creation of essentially a two-tier justice system for Muslim Americans and everybody else, uh, and all of, the, uh, all of the wars abroad, uh, not to mention the obvious and flagrant uh, hypocrisy uh, of the right wing that uh, says that it, it, it cares so much about 3,000 Americans dying, uh, but uh, is oddly indifferent uh, as we're rounding the 200,000 deaths uh, from the response, which at best is criminally negligent uh, to the coronavirus plague, uh, and at worst is something much worse than that, which we're finding out from the new revelations from, uh, from Bob Woodward uh, about Donald Trump um, openly acknowledging, knowing he was on the record, by the way, openly acknowledging the tremendous gap between the reality uh, and what he was criminally telling the public to try to minimize uh, the scope of the danger of the pandemic, uh, which nicely brings us to a couple of questions uh, from um, uh, Jonathan Ross, mostly, uh, about, um, by the way, I should say Jeremy Salmon. I should also check out uh, his podcast, uh, his and a few other people's. It's called Giving the Mic to the Wrong Person. It's always good stuff. Uh, so, but there's some questions from, uh, from Jonathan Ross uh, about uh, the election, uh, you know, Trump and, uh, and Biden uh, and, uh, and how those of us who see that what Biden is offering is also criminally inadequate to the needs of the moment uh, should think about the election. He mentioned Susan Sarandon. Uh, who is a punching bag for uh, neoliberal idiots. They love to blame her for the 2016 election, uh, saying uh, that, uh, that, she, um, that she will vote for Biden as a vote against fascism and then would fight him by starting a People's Party on the progressive left, going after him for his Wall Street ties. Um, and uh, although I guess she'd also tweeted support for socialist podcaster Ryan Knight for saying he would not vote to Biden due to his being a corporatist. Uh, and I think that both halves of, of what she's working through there are right, that, uh, that Biden obviously is a corporatist, uh, even though, as Thomas Frank said earlier in the episode, uh, he's somebody who stylistically, who in terms of the way he talks about politics, comes from an earlier earlier era of Democratic Party politics. He's at least trying to pander to working class people rather than uh, trying to pander to the professional managerial class. But the man is pretty much a credit card lobby incarnated as human being uh, in terms of his despicable legislative record without even getting into his supervillain role in the saga of mass incarceration over the decades. Uh, so he is despicable. That part is absolutely true. He is in no way, shape, or form a friend of working class people. Um, but it's also true that the kind of right-wing pseudo-populist uh, authoritarianism that's represented by Trump that we've seen 
uh, in everything from uh, shoving protesters into unmarked vans in Portland uh, to, um, to floating these trial balloons on Twitter about just not having an election in November, uh, that that is a different kind of threat. And I think you can see that without going all the way to saying that Trump is a fascist and recognizing that his brand of right-wing demagogue is very different in a lot of ways from the classical European fascists. Uh, but it, it's true that that is the other half of this dilemma. Uh, and what should anybody do about it? Well, the first thing that I would say is if you live in most states, uh, do whatever the hell you want, right? Vote for Howie Hawkins, uh, vote for the ghost of Eugene V. Debs, uh, ghost of Merle Haggard, um, you know, just, just write uh, F you uh, on, uh, on the mail-in ballot uh, and send it in uh, as, as a write-in candidate. Uh, do what you like, because given the reality of the electoral college, uh, that really is in many states just completely irrelevant to the outcome. But what about people who live in swing states, uh, which would, by the way, include me? Uh, so I am in Georgia right now, which did go to Trump, um, but by a vastly narrower margin than you might think. It's a rapidly purpling swing state. Uh, there's a good chance that by the election, I'm gonna be back in Michigan, which went to Trump last time, but uh, has gone to every Democrat uh, since Clinton, or I think maybe even Dukakis. Dukakis might have lost uh, Michigan in 88, but if so, that was the last time before Trump. Um, and in any case, wherever you know I'm voting, by the time it's time to figure that out, uh, I can tell you what I'm doing, which is not the same as yelling at anybody else to do it. I think scolding people uh, over what they plan to do on the in the in the voting booth, I think it's is counterproductive at best. It's a stupid activity. Um, I think that both the ultra left who think it's a betrayal to, uh, to vote uh, for Biden, even as a tactical defensive maneuver, and liberals uh, who think that you're not even allowed to call Biden the lesser evil because he's not evil, uh, both over-moralize the decisions that people make about the bad choices that our rigged system presents them in the voting booth, and I'm not interested in that. I think that trying to yell at anybody about however they navigate that dilemma uh, is silly even on its face because if your goal is to change voting behavior, uh, usually scolding people in that kind of ridiculous, hysterical, moralistic way actually makes, you know, like human psychology be what it is. That makes most people dig in their heels. Uh, it's a terrible strategy and in any case, I'm just not interested in playing that role. But if anybody asks me my tactical advice, I'll give it, uh, which is that even though both of these guys are definitely enemies of the working class. I think that we have to start from radical honesty about that premise. Uh, they represent different strategies for the ruling class, different ways for the ruling class to manage capitalism. Uh, and sometimes those differences actually are quite significant. Uh, so certainly in terms of technocratic management of the coronavirus, uh, I think there'd be a difference. Uh, there'd be a difference there uh, that, could, that could make a large difference. Um, crucially, the thing that I think strategically matters the most is about organized labor. Because if we don't have an organized working class at the base, any attempt at socialist politics is ultimately going to be shouting into the wind. And Trump is going to continue to appoint Republicans to the National Labor Relations Board and to the courts whose mission in life, their goal, what makes them get up in the morning is trying to wipe out unions and end collective bargaining in the United States, certainly the public sector. Uh, and Biden is certainly no friend of labor, uh, but he's going to appoint Democrats to those things, you know, where possible. Uh, and the democratic strategy for managing capitalism is just a little bit different. It, it assumes a framework in which public sector unions continue to exist and collect dues. And that might be a, an unexciting thing to say from a certain point of view, but strategically, I think it's something that matters. So I think rather than seeing the question as being which one of these reactionary scumbags should be awarded the gift of our support, uh, we should think of it uh, like we're, if you've ever watched the, um, the horror comedy Cabin in the Woods, 
uh, in that movie, uh, there's, there's a scene where people are in the basement and even though they don't realize what well, this is what they're doing, they have to pick which monster they're gonna fight uh, by, by picking out the, the totem uh, that, uh, that belongs to, to them, right? Is it gonna be the cannibalistic redneck zombies? Is it gonna be, you know, the, um, you know, the, the Cthulhu, you know, squid horror, you know, what's it gonna be? Um, and I think that's the situation that we're in. We're in the basement of the cabin in the woods. We don't get to support uh, a candidate who would actually represent, even in a modest social democratic way, the agenda that we want. Some of us tried real hard uh, to, uh, to bring that about, uh, campaigning for Bernie Sanders, but we lost. Uh, and so we don't have the option of supporting an agenda that we actually like. We can make a purely symbolic gesture of voting third party. I think that's fine in most states. Uh, but my advice, if asked for people in swing states, would be to do what I'm planning to do, which is basically in that cabin in the woods basement, I don't know what the Bidem totem would be, maybe a uh, corn pops, uh, rusty switchblade, but pick that, right? That's the enemy that you wanna fight for the uh, next four years, the rotten, despicable neoliberal Democrat, uh, not the increasingly authoritarian uh, extreme right-wing demagogue. I think strategically that's the best move. Your mileage may differ. In any case, um, today we, uh, we talked to um, Christopher Patton, um, who is the author of the Iowa City Police Log, Life and Strife in a Midwestern College Town, uh, which is available for pre-order. You should check it out. I've, I've really been enjoying the Iowa City Police Logs for years. Uh, talked to Thomas Frank, uh, who's the author of several books, including What's the Matter with Kansas, Listen Liberal, Whatever Happened to the Party of the People, uh, and now uh, the people know uh, a brief history of anti-populism, uh, and Freddie DeBoer, author of The Cult of Smart, How Our Broken Education System Perpetuates Social Injustice. These are all books that I would very strongly recommend. Um, just on general principle, I use Amazon when I have to, but if you can get them from Red Emma's, uh, it's a worker-owned bookshop uh, that, you know, I just try to promote worker-owned enterprises whenever I possibly can. So it's redemmas.org, I believe, uh, is the link to order the stuff from them. I'd strongly recommend all of those. Uh, next episode, I'm gonna be talking to uh, Nando Vila, uh, who is the host, along with uh, the great Anna Kasparian of the Weekend Show on Jacobin. He's also the host of the uh, Pandemic Entourage Rewatch podcast, uh, Let's Pot It Out. Uh, which I was on last week. So I'm gonna be talking about Nando Vila. We're probably gonna be getting into uh, US imperialism in Latin America. I'm also gonna be talking to uh, Emma Vigland uh, from the Young Turks. And of course, as there was this week, as there is every week, uh, there's going to be uh, another segment of Outlaws and Revolutionaries to cap off the episode uh, with a brother, David Griscom. Uh, so uh, I'm really looking forward uh, to that episode. Thank you guys for watching. It means a lot to me. Left is best. I will see you next week.